Welcome to today's workshop. Today we'll be talking about uh, endorsing open science and supporting what has been referred to as a credibility revolution. I'll be sharing with you a little bit about my own journey through open science, what got me into open science, why I decided that open science is important for me and how I started doing open science step-by-step step to um, get to the point that I am at right now. So it's been quite the journey. Uh, it started for me somewhere around 2016, 2017, when I was a postdoc. And then throughout this journey, I realized all sorts of things and decided to try different uh, directions. And most of them have worked out really well. Uh, so I want to share some of that with you. And hopefully that will give you a direction if you're in early career or you're somebody who is interested in open science but not really sure how to go about it. Uh, I'll be talking about the challenges, the benefits. Uh, I'll be showing you hands-on some of the practical tools. Uh, we'll do some stuff together. I'll show you my first ever pre-registration of a replication. So we'll be doing that replication together, and then I'll show you how I pre-register this. We'll go in the open science framework, we'll pre-register this together. Then I'll ask you to answer a few questions, and then we'll have a look at uh, uh, how, how we do this kind of data analysis and how we share the results on the open science framework. Um, so tackling almost every dimension in this uh, big umbrella called open science uh, that hopefully will make it more friendly for you. Uh, sometimes it seems a bit overwhelming. Where do I start? What do I do? Um, but then this is aimed to give you some kind of a direction, a little bit of a taste of what open science is. If there's anything about what it is that I'm showing that you want me to show more or something that you're not, um, you know, you need a little bit more information, something that you have more questions, something that you have some concerns or issues, something that you've tried and failed or tried and have a different solution, uh, then I'm very happy to, to talk to you. Uh, just let me know in the chat and, and I'll try and address this uh, throughout. It's meant to be around three hours, but it doesn't have to be. It could be less, could be more. It depends on how, uh, how well we do. And we'll try and have a break uh, in between. And then you can kind of decide if, you, uh, if there's anything else that you want me to do aside from going over the slides uh, and ask more questions uh, during. Okay. I owe a lot of credit to a lot of people. Most of these slides are not my own. I borrow these from a lot of wonderful people in the open science community. I think one of the great things about the open science community is that really um, we, we share. Uh, so even when we have presentations, uh, PowerPoints, um, preprints, uh, all, all sorts of guides and primers and uh, trying to help early career researchers uh, through this uh, journey, uh, then we also share all this information. We share the, vid the videos, the PowerPoints. So it's very easy to go through each one of those. Everything is uh, openly available online. Uh, some of these are part of journal clubs, uh, reproducibility, or uh, the Riot Club, or uh, some other clubs that are uh, on YouTube. And typically, they also have a link to, to the slides. Plus, uh, in this cloud folder that I um, uh, put the link on over here, you'll find all of these uh, presentations, all of the things that I borrowed from. So I kind of try to mesh everything together. But if you want more information, then you can always go on this uh, cloud folder uh, and, and have a look. Uh, throughout the presentation, uh, the cloud folder uh, is moving from here to down here below. So at any time, feel free to go and download the slides, these slides, and also go on the cloud folder and see some of the demonstrations and the other things uh, that, that I'm going to share. So um, if you are interested in uh, open science more broadly, this is not the first or the last workshop that I'll be giving on open science. And because we do everything on Zoom this uh, semester, this year, then I try and edit this and then upload everything online to YouTube. So uh, if at some point you feel like you need to go away and then you want to come back, or if I was speaking too fast and then you want to go back and have a look, then you're very welcome to go on this link over here. And then you can see that we've done quite a few of these 
uh, workshops. You can see over here that I did a workshop on pre-registrations and registered reports. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about pre-registrations and registered reports. So what is the difference between the two? And, and there's also a live demonstration. Uh, we do a little bit in this workshop on that, but if you want a more hands-on comprehensive um, demonstration of what is a pre-registration, then you can go and have a look over there. It's about two and a half hours. If you're interested in transitioning, let's say that you're working with a SPSS, SAS, Theta, uh, and, and all that, and you want to move into open source software like uh, Jamovi, R, and JASP, then here I give a demonstration on how to uh, do that. I also uh, summarized recently uh, three years of this uh, big project that we've been doing here at University of Hong Kong of mass replications and extensions. We've completed in the last three years about 100 of these. Some of them are pre-registered replications and extensions, and some of them are what is referred to as registered reports stage one. So if you want to learn more about that, if you're thinking about maybe you want to join us as an early career researcher, then this is the uh, workshop uh, for you. Plus, if you're interested in a meta-analysis, then there's also a workshop of about two and a half hours on how do you conduct an open reproducible meta-analysis, which is another challenge that goes beyond all the other things, uh, you know, the kind of experimental and correlational designs that we typically do. There's something about meta-analysis that requires an additional step. Plus, I give a lot of uh, open science talks and this uh, year also, uh, most of them recorded and uploaded. So if you wanna keep track on that, uh, you're very welcome. In addition, I highly recommend some of these talks. Um, I learned a lot from, uh, from these that was uh, looking at the reproducibility and the, the Riots Club and, and Dan Quintana does a, a really amazing job at communicating these things. These are typically shorter presentations, about an hour or so, an hour and a half. I think Dan Quintana does a little bit uh, uh, you know, shorter than that. So if you want to know more beyond what it is that I'm talking about, you're welcome to uh, check out any of these uh, presentations. But you can see the titles. I really like the titles and I'll be using some of their slides. Easing into open science, so there's no time like the present. So if you decided that you want to do open science, then how best to go about it? And I'll uh, use some of their uh, nice uh, road path that they've been using uh, to, to in, so it covers a, a preprint or a publication that they've been working on. Uh, in addition, um, aside from all the benefits of open science for the community, for science, you know, just be doing good science, there are also some selfish reasons for you uh, to, do, to do open science. So this presentation really uh, talks about that. So why would you, for your benefit, for your career, want to work reproducibly and, uh, and in open, transparent way? Uh, uh, also other things like if you're an early career researcher or you're a feminist researcher, so what's in there for you, uh, tackling all sorts of other dimensions of, of open science. Um, check those out, have a look, see if you can uh, learn anything from that. The last thing that I want to share kind of like as a broad resource is that uh, it's difficult for me to cover everything about open science. Sometimes I cover this in multiple sessions uh, with the undergraduates here in the University of Hong Kong. I cover the open science uh, reproducibility replication crisis and the credibility revolution over an entire semester. So 13 sessions of two hours with the students uh, tackling each one of these dimensions. But here it's a very short uh, workshop and it's very targeted at doing things practically. So if you want to see uh, that, uh, first I'll direct you to uh, this uh, website that I have and uh, you can um, you know, ch check it out and, and see everything. So if you go to my website, which is mgto.org, you'll see a few uh, pages. Uh, this mass replication and extension over here uh, that is open right now has a lot of resources. First of all, it tells you about the master application and extensions, but also there's lots of resources here. 
So if you want to see some examples from our projects, from the students, or if you want to see all our guides, all of them are collaborative. If you want to know more about uh, uh, the templates, uh, everything that I am presenting and talking about over here, if you want to know how to do a meta-analysis uh, in a reproducible way. So all these resources are available for you here. Uh, in addition, if you want to know about the open science and replication crisis, then there's lots of resources here and you'll see my own talk. So I talk about the science crisis. All of my classes, first session, I start with the science crisis because I feel it's really important for the students to begin with an understanding of the situation in the field. Uh, but you don't have to listen to me talk about these sort of things. You can uh, um, have a look at uh, some other people. So there's lots of resources, but also there's, there, there are videos from all sorts of uh, other people. If you like a bit of humor, then John Oliver with the Last Week Tonight show. Um, lots of things tackling all sorts of issues like statistics or the open access. There's Brian Osek from the Center of Open Science. So you can spend uh, quite some time uh, going over this page, uh, looking at all the podcast sessions and all the uh, different things. Another thing which is remarkable that our students did is that we crowdsourced writing a book about the credibility revolution. So this book was written by the students here at HKU. There's about 206 pages of this. So if there's anything that you want to know more about uh, the, the credibility re revolution, then please go uh, here and have a look, listen to the talks, listen to the podcast, uh, read the books uh, and so forth. Um, all right, so let's go back to uh, our slides. Uh, Okay, so typically what I do, just like I explained with uh, the students, my, uh, the undergraduates in my course, is that I describe what is the science crisis and what is going on. Uh, but I feel like if you attended uh, this workshop, if you did, uh, you know, you, you took out of your own time in order to attend this, I'm assuming that you're already somewhat familiar with the science crisis. Therefore, I'm going to push this uh, till afterwards. I'm going to start with my own journey and my own demonstration. And I want to um, at least uh, invite you, let's assume that there is something going on. Uh, I'll try and summarize this with my own summary as something that is not controversial. So let's say that if there's something going on right now in science, my own summary is that I am convinced that at the very least we're in some need of self-reflection, reassessment and improvement. And sometimes when I talk about the science crisis, people say, why are you using such big words like crisis? Why does it have to be? Why is everything so pessimistic? It's really not. Um, so I look at open science as something that's a very positive, constructive, supportive kind of environment. And I really like these two uh, cartoons over here because I think they really represent how I perceive pushback on open science. I think open science is just like it's, it's, generally, it's generally a good thing. So uh, originally this was about climate. So for example, if people talk about climate change and you know we want to improve, uh, reduce the, the carbon uh, footprint and we want to do energy independence, preserve the rainforest, have green jobs, livable cities. And then somebody gets up and sh uh, shouts, what if it's all a big hoax and we create a world, a better world for nothing? So yes, let's create a better world. Let's do that. Same thing with open science. It's like we're talking about simple things that are the essence at the core of science, uh, data sharing, reducing publication bias, improving the use of statistics, uh, tackling all sorts of biases like p-hacking, generally improving transparency. Uh, and then sometimes, you know, when I give talks about this, some people are like, but what if this is all a big hoax? There's no crisis and we create a better science for nothing. So I'm like, regardless of what it is that you think is going on, let's just create a better science and put aside all the situation. But I will tell you my understanding of the situation later on. Uh, we'll start with uh, my own uh, journey through this. Assuming that there's something going on, these are my own principles. And it took me some time to get to these principles. I'll tell you first that in my own journey, I started my PhD in 2009. I did an exchange uh, during my PhD to a different university during 2012. And then I graduated in 2014 and went to a postdoc. I had two postdocs. 
It's only in my second postdoc in 2016 that I really was able to get control over my situation, to sit down with myself. I had no one uh, monitoring me or uh, managing me or telling me I wasn't assigned to a project or I didn't have a specific schedule. I had two years to sit down and think as an early career researcher during this postdoc, aiming for a tenure track, aiming for an academic career, what is it that I want to emphasize? And in 2015, 2016, there were already some very uh, big, big signs that, that things are, are going uh, in the wrong direction. Therefore, I sat down with myself and thought, what should I do? So what, what do I care about? What is, it, what is my understanding of the current situation? Where do I think that we are going? And these are the principles that I laid down for myself. Uh, and I strongly recommend that you, if you're an early career researcher, let's say uh, MPhil, PhD, you're thinking of an academic career, and you're thinking down, down the road, you're not thinking just about right now, you're thinking it's like when I graduate, or if, uh, if you're already like a postdoc, or if you're already a first year, second year assistant professor, you're thinking it's like, so in five years, I'm going to be facing a tenure committee. So thinking long-term, what is it, is it that I want to do in my own research? What do I want to represent my identity? So in 2016, uh, I decided to take everything that I've done up until that moment and put it aside. Um, there's all sorts of uh, big changes that happened. For example, I did my PhD in business, in the business school at the management department, but right now I am an assistant professor in social psychology. So I moved from a very atypical move to move from a business school to psychology. But I decided that this represents a move towards more transparency, more trustworthiness in terms of the research that is done and, and what the trends that are happening in those uh, fields. In addition, I had these uh, guiding principles for myself. So for example, one of the things in the business school management department uh, that they do is that they really look at a lot of complex models in a very specific context. And I wanted things that are very broad, looking at something that are very simple, you know, main effects. Because one of the realizations that we had is that uh, we don't really have a lot of uh, power. So many of the studies that have been done up until 2011 were just under underpowered. If you have complex models, if you have moderation, mediation, multi-level and all this, you really need to compensate with power. And that becomes a big issue because many times we don't have a large sample. We don't have the right design that would be able to tackle this kind of of research question. So I said, I'm going to start from very, very simple. And I'm going to show you what I mean by simple. It's very, very simple. It's as simple as you can imagine. So I start from small and little, you know, step by step, I increase the complexity. So it doesn't mean that I won't ever get to complex, but I start from uh, simple. I focus on effect size. So rather than this uh, uh, p-value lower than 0 0.05, this obsession that people have with p-values, and really emphasizing effect sizes and confidence intervals and looking at you know, a, a scale of an effect rather than yes or no. It worked or it didn't work. Um, so doing a lot of uh, power. Um, and then this was a big commitment to me because back in 2016, honestly, I did not know how to do a pre-registration. It was very scary for me how to tackle a pre-registration. People were talking about this. The Center of Open Science was doing the pre-registration challenge. So one of my students, the first pre-registration that we've ever done was part of this pre-registration challenge. So I wrote this down, but I honestly did not know how to tackle this. In addition, findings are findings. It means that it doesn't matter what I find. I'm going to communicate all of this. This is also a big one, and I'm going to talk about this uh, later, doing more replications. So I need to know what's trustworthy. I honestly don't know. Looking at the literature, you know, if, if things like, you know, things that we've uh, always thought taking for granted, like, for example, one thing for me that I always took for granted was ego depletion. Uh, if things like ego depletion don't replicate very well, perhaps we need to do a lot more replications. So before I do new research, I'm going to do direct replications of the research that I want to build my research about. So um, that was a big step for me. I also did not know how to do replications. What does it mean to do a replication? 
Uh, a lot of people told me it's not valuable. Um, it's very, very easy. Uh, but then when I asked them, so you did a replication. Do you, you've seen that this is easy. Most of them says, no, no, we just know that it's easy. We've never done one, but it just seems like a very easy thing. But then I, I realized that replication is a skill, uh, almost to a point of, of being somewhat of an art, you know, to be able to do replications well, you need a lot of knowledge base, but you also need to you have a good grasp and understanding in tackling the different designs and different elements. Um, collaboration and community is very important. So I try to invest in this, but full transparency, this is the core of everything. When people talk about uh, open open science, I think a lot of people sometimes focus on the sharing of all materials, data, and code. And this is very important. We need to share all the data, uh, the materials, uh, and the code. Uh, the, the people that pay our salary uh, are the taxpayers. Uh, they're the ones who finance our you know, data collections. They're the ones that pay for our salaries. For us to say, no, this is mine, I'm going to keep this and I'm going to share this just because, you know, I want to capitalize on this or produce another paper or, I don't know, all sorts of other reasons uh, is, is not, is, is not a, um, a viable uh, reason. For me, it's unacceptable. It's really, it's really important that we share everything that we collect. Uh, some days you need to anonymize, some days you can share because there's all sorts of things that might be identifiable. But now we know that there's... Uh, many ways to share uh, everything. Even if you can't share the actual data, you can do uh, synthetic uh, data sets to simulate something that looks like your data, but you need to share in order for others to be able to verify what it is that you've done and build on this for the future if they want to you know, combine things. So just imagine if we wouldn't share anything about COVID, if every lab would work uh, on its own without sharing basic things about that, then we wouldn't be able to get, you know, in, in less than a year to get to, vaccines and get to all sorts of treatments and, and sharing these things around the world. So it's really, it's really needed, but open science goes far beyond that. It's not just about materials, data and code. It's also about sharing the entire process about everything that you do. And if you go on my website, you see that from the first, uh, from the first stage where I just think about an idea, I already put this on my website and I invite others to join me I say, okay, this is, this is where I want to go. Who, who wants to come? And then from the research question, step by step, every time I do something, I go on Twitter and I say, open review, who wants to help us? This is what we've done. Do you have any feedback? This is what we're planning. Do you have any feedback? So this way you have complete transparency about every step of the way of what you've done in your entire life cycle of the project. And very important, and I feel like a lot of us are failing this, reporting all the research direction, uh, the decisions. So why did you exclude this and not this? Why did you report only this condition and not that condition, this variable and not that variable? So for me, full transparency is as broad as you can imagine. It's about everything, just being completely transparent by default about everything that you do from beginning until the end, You know when you archive uh, the project and move on to the next one. In addition, just like I said before, I had all sorts of research directions, but because I was not sure what replicates, what doesn't replicate, I put all of this aside and I sat down with myself and I asked, what is it that you trust? So I was looking at the entire literature in social psychology and cognitive psychology, and I came to the decision that of all the effects that I've seen, the classic heuristics and biases, you know, this Kahneman, Tversky, uh, stuff from the 1960s, 70s. This is a literature that feels to me intuitively, feels a little bit stronger, more solid, more transparent than everything else. Uh, it's, it's an intuitive decision. It could, could have went into a different direction. So you maybe have your own intuitions. So I needed to check this. So once I decided I'm going to focus on judgment decision making, and this was not my original uh, domain, put everything aside, focus on judgment decision-making. And then I said, I'm going to verify in order to make sure that really my intuitions are accurate. And I'm going to do this by running replications and extension. So after I decided on these principles, I made a point of my research. 2017 Maastricht University in the Netherlands, they came to me and they said, well, you're a postdoc now, so you need to mentor master's students. Uh, they will do a thesis with you. So you get uh, between three and six uh, students. Uh, what, what are your research domains? So I said, actually, the research domain broadly is judgment decision-making, maybe social psychology, but let's focus judgment decision-making. But 
I'm going to be very different from all the other faculty. I will only work with students on one of two things. Either we will do a pre-registered replication and extension, or sometimes end, do a pre-registered meta-analysis. Both of, both of these things, just so we understand, both of these things I had absolutely no idea how to do. Whenever I asked people, so how do you do this? People said, we, we don't know. So there were some pre-registration templates for uh, all kinds of, of things in the literature. Uh, one group from the Netherlands had some kind of uh, template for replication, the replication recipe. But other than that, I've, I haven't seen anybody use this and I definitely have not seen publications. So this was a big step. And actually in my department, they were a little bit worried about this. And they said, uh, uh, we're not sure that any students would want to work with you. And they were actually right because of all the students in that year, there were only uh, three students. Later came a fourth one. There were only three students that chose me. <laughs> but the interesting thing that these three students that chose me uh, the only ones that chose me also chose me as their first priority. So they really wanted to do this pre-registered uh, pre replications and pre-registered meta-analysis. So that was an interesting uh, start to this whole uh, thing. Now, I want to explain why I decided to do replications and extensions. I feel like nowadays, still four years after that, I only do replications and extensions with my thesis students. And you can go on my website and see the reason for why that is. And I feel like this is the most uh, doable for thesis students. I also feel like this is the correct first step for any researcher because you really learn a lot about research. It's very, very valuable, first of all, because that was a one year master's. So to do a one year master's where you have to, you know, first do your courses and then also do data collection. And then also, you know, a bunch of things you need to think of something novel and look at the literature and then think of the design from the scratch. It's a lot of work for a master's, even for a PhD, it's a lot of work, you know, doing a thesis, you know, some people will work on this for uh, four years. But my understanding of replications is that you can do this within a single semester. and. We now, with our undergraduates at HKU, with as early as second year undergraduates, do pre-registered replications and extension in a single uh, semester. Plus, uh, it's easier to run these experiments, especially in judgment and decision making, because the students don't do the data collection. They design everything. They do the pre-registration. They do the survey design. They give this to me. And I go online with Amazon Mechanical Turk and British Prolific, and I collect the data within five, six hours, we have a data set. So they don't have to run around collecting data. So all of this can be done in very, very short schedule of a single semester. Second, and I think this is very important, especially for a student that's starting out, there's a lot of reasons why you might fail. Maybe you don't know the literature, maybe you don't have experience, maybe something went wrong in the design. Some students don't get a lot of guidance from, from their mentors. But the nice thing about a replication uh, plus extension is that these are measurable. So you can um, look at the design of the replication and compare this to the original. And it's very easy to see if there are any deviations and then document these deviations. So it's very easy for me to assess when a student does a replication, whether this seems like it goes with the original study. And then the extension is built on top of the replication so I can really differentiate what is the original and what is the added, the new, the new one. Now consider if everything is novel, if everything is new and you fail, you didn't find support for your hypothesis, how do you know uh, what failed? Maybe it's not you, maybe you did everything perfect, but you know the findings that you thought were trustworthy uh, are not replicating. So how do you know if it's the novel or or maybe it's something about the measurement or something about the original design, something about the original phenomena. So if you do a replication and extension, the replication works, but the extension doesn't work, then you know, okay, so the extension is what failed, but the replication is what, what succeeded. So the phenomena seems reliable. And then I added knowledge to uh, the literature. Now we know that this, uh, this phenomena is, is trustworthy, at least we, I get some better assessment of the effect size and so forth. But perhaps next time in my PhD or my next project, I can think of a different extension and then I can build on this in a different direction. If the uh, replication fails, then maybe you want to change direction and say, I don't want to invest anymore in that direction. 
if you would do everything novel, you wouldn't know. You would try another novel study. It will fail again. Maybe the phenomena itself is not replicable. So a replication and extension is really step-by-step -step incremental work on uh, building uh, on, on the literature. It's very systematic, so there's less uncertainty. You know exactly, supposedly, you're supposed to know what, what went on in the original study. It's a very clear process. Now we have this very comprehensive guide. You can go step-by-step -step on how to do this. What is it that... that needs to be done and I'll show you some of that and then whatever your insights failed replication successful replication failed extension successful extension all of these are valuable no findings are valuable you're updating the knowledge in the literature so replications and extensions really address all of the issues in thesis work in early career uh, going to uh, solid uh, you know, revisiting the, the foundation step-by-step -step incremental in order to get us to a cumulative uh, knowledge about a certain phenomena. And then I think doing hands-on real research, starting from undergraduate, uh, by revisiting classics, you know, really impactful thousands of cit citations, visiting the classics in the field is really instructive. There's lots of things that you can learn from that. So what does that look like? Till now I was talking a lot, but I feel like it's time for us to uh, see, see an example. So I'm gonna talk to you about my first ever pre-registered replication and extension. This was done with a master's student in 2017. His name was Lucas. And he decided to visit something called the exceptionality effect. Uh, it's uh, from a very famous uh, st study. It's actually a review paper by Kahneman and Miller. It's called norm theory. If you look it up, you'll see, I think at least 3000 citations or more. And then the same, the same Miller here, the same Miller is the one that did, did the second study in the, in the uh, Miller and uh, McFarland. So uh, he took two scenarios from uh, this review paper, and then he took an experiment from the second one and he ran those. And I'm gonna run these together uh, with you. So in order for you to see just how simple these things are, I'm gonna show you what these experiments are and I'm gonna ask you to participate in this experiment together with me on Mentimeter. Before I do that, I'm going to pre-register this with you. So without telling you what the experiment is about, I'm just gonna say that in the cloud folder, so this is our cloud folder. So if you'll go on the cloud folder and you'll open this, you'll see that there are different uh, things in that folder. Uh, if you don't know what the link is, it's over here on, on, the, on the bottom right. So you can see it's mgto.org slash 2021 OS folder. And in this folder, you'll see uh, demonstrations, some presentations. This is the presentation that I'm showing you now. If you want to see other people's presentations, then you can see all the people that I quoted, like Dan Quintana, etc. And then the demonstration I'm going to show you now is this exceptionality demonstration. So if we go into this, you'll see that I have already written a demonstration for you with a pre-registration. I will go over the pre-registration later after we actually do the experiment. But first I want to say that I wrote a pre-registration. Actually, I took exactly what Lucas did and I adapted this to what it is that we're doing right now. And um, I also did a data analysis plan. And just to make it interesting, I did the experiment one with R and the experiment two I did with Jamovi. So I'm gonna show you what that looks like uh, and how, how to analyze this kind of thing. So we already have a data analysis uh, plan over here. I also uh, created some sample output, but it's not that needed. Uh, and then I created all sorts of screen for the experiment. So I want to be able to uh, share this. So it looks uh, something like this. You'll see these screens uh, very, very soon. So let's say that right now I have this uh, pre-registration over here. And I want to conduct this uh, replication and extension. So I've designed everything. I want to collect the data, but before I collect the data, I need to pre-register. What does it look like to pre-register? So what we'll do is that we'll go on the Open Science Framework. And the Open Science Framework is the place where we uh, register everything, where we share our data. Open Science Framework is one of the most important tools that I have in my disposal to do open science. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the open science framework, but if you're not, then it's time for you to, to join in and have a look. 
I share everything, not just my research, not only my pre-registrations, but also the videos that I do, also my course materials, everything that I want to share with the entire community, I can upload. Sometimes my videos are gigabytes. Sometimes my slides are very, very heavy. Nobody has ever asked me for money. Uh, I can upload as much as I want. I can create as many projects as needed. And as you can see, I actually use this quite a lot. Uh, and there's a lot of things that are going on on the Open Science Framework. So, you can see each one of these projects, either I'm uh, with myself, so for example, uh, combining all the findings from our replications, but some of them are with other people. So for example, uh, we just completed the preprint of the default effect uh, with Prasad over here. Uh, one of the uh, students that is working with me, Chinyu over here, um, and, and, and many others. So a nice thing about Open Science Framework is that it also allows for our collaboration. And I'm going to show you some examples of what these uh, uh, look like. Just give you a quick, quick look at uh, one uh, real project. So the default effects, for example, uh, we did two replications of something called the default effect. I won't go into what that means, but we had two uh, registrations and then we shared everything, the analysis and, uh, and the code uh, with R, our markdown. We shared all the uh, data sets, the raw data sets. Uh, we have a pre-registration over here. We had group A and group B. And then we also shared uh, uh, preprints and uh, you know the the the, the actual uh, manuscript. And if you want to see, you can have a look. If you want to see who's a contributor, so Prasad and Paul over here are contributors. And on the different groups, uh, the students, the undergraduate students that did the replications are are the the authors on on that. So what we're gonna do for our little experiment right now to uh, replicate what Lucas and I did in Maastricht, we're gonna create a new project. And this is going to be the project where we pre-register what it is that we're going to do in this project. So we're gonna go over here, we're gonna create a new project. And we're gonna call this the um, exceptionality effect uh, works for the open science workshop. You can decide uh, where you want to host uh, the files. I don't really care much about this, but some Europeans uh, prefer this in Germany. So we can just like, select Germany, I don't know. So you can create this and uh, it says create it successfully. So let's go to the project. And you have different ways to do uh, pre-registration. My favorite way, uh, actually I do all of the uh, pre-registrations this way, is that I create my own file based on my own template. So we have our own uh, way of doing pre-registrations. And then I upload these as files. So for example, here you have storage. So you can create a folder and this folder will be a pre-registration. You can see that I've done this many times. It creates this pre-registration over here, this folder. And then um, you can simply uh, you know, take these files, the pre-registrations and upload, upload them into that folder. So for example, I can also add under the pre-registration, I can also add a data analysis then. Yeah. So um, what you can see here is that I can, I'm going to just drag things into the relevant uh, folders. So I'm gonna uh, upload all of these together. I'm gonna put this in the pre-registration. You can see it's uploading everything. And then in the data analysis plan, I'm gonna drag this into the data analysis plan. It tells me when everything is uh, finished. I'm gonna also upload my data analysis plan. I'm also going to upload my, let's say, sample output. So now, uh, basically what we have is that we have an OSF storage with a lot of files in it. And one of these files is the pre-registration. So if I click, on this, on this file, actually it would open up in the Open Science Framework. If you're familiar with this, uh, you've seen this many times, it translates this in, into, so it's a document, but it translates this into a PDF and then it opens this, uh, this PDF. And you can see that it has the hypothesis of uh, the methods of how I'm gonna run this. Uh, what is the IV? What is the DV? Uh, exclusion criteria, what is the planned sample uh, and so forth. And then an analysis, an analysis plan. Um, oh, okay, sorry, this is not the right one. This is the right one. This is the workshop. This is the, the other one was the original that I ran with Lucas. So here in the workshop, 
uh, we don't have three experiments, we have two experiments. Yeah, so experiment one, experiment three. Yeah, so this is simplified and this is our, uh, and then we set the alpha and then we say what we're gonna compare this to, the kind of test that we're going to run and uh, so forth. So we have everything that we need in order to do a pre-registration. Uh, actually, before we run the pre-registration, I'm gonna remove the old files just so nobody gets confused about our pre-registration. So if you need, you can of course, delete some files. So I'm gonna delete the original one. All right, so now you're ready to do your pre-registration. What does a pre-registration look like? Uh, I'm gonna go to this uh, registration over here. And you have a few templates that are built in in the Open Science Framework. Uh, basically what a pre-registration does is that it takes a copy of everything that you have uploaded, creates a copy of that, it freezes that copy so that nobody can ever touch this and it's going to be there forever. And then it puts a timestamp on it. So if you pre-register this uh, that, that way, you can always go to the reviewers or the editors and say, this is what I hypothesized before I did the data collection. So you can look at the timestamp for the pre-registration. You can look at the timestamp for the data collection. And then you can see that the pre-registration, all my hypothesis, all my data analysis plan, everything was done before I actually did the data collection. So uh, I'm reducing the probability that I'm going to fool myself because I know exactly that I hypothesized everything and that I uh, reduced my flexibility before I did any data collection. Now, you have a lot of templates. You can decide what you want to do. Uh, sometimes we use uh, replication recipes. Sometimes we use uh, the OSF uh, pre-registration. Pre if you do that, uh, actually what it does is that it creates um, you know, a form for you and you can, uh, you know, you can use this form. I uh, can put the description, you can say who this con contributor, the license, uh, you know, study information, the design plan, the sampling plan. So it asks you a lot of things that I already included in my uh, document. The document is based on some template from uh, Journal of Experimental Social Psychology. So I'm going to ignore this uh, for now. I'm gonna go back to uh, the registrations. I'm gonna show you the registration that I usually use. And this registration is what's called open-ended registration. So actually, I don't need to type anything into a form because I've already um, prepared a document with all of my pre-registrations. So I'm gonna create a draft. The only thing that you'll see in the form is what is the title. So this is the title and the description. I'm just gonna say, please see pre-registration folder for document and data analysis plan. So um, this is this is enough, this is uh, uh, sufficient. And uh, then what uh, licensee you want. So let's say for example, over here, we're using the uh, CC by attribute. So, um, what kind of field this is social psychology if you want some tags you can add some tags then we continue i'm going to say do the exactly same thing if you want you can select some of the specific ones so for example i can select the specific uh, documents that i want to serve as the actual uh, pre-registration but it will create a copy of everything so everything that's in my directory is going to be frozen but this uh, specific uh, file over here is the one that's going to be highlighted. Uh, and then I just do a review. Uh, I can, uh, it seems like everything is ready. So I'm gonna just register this. And then it gives me the choice of, do you want to make this public immediately or do you want to keep this private for a few years? You can do up to four years. Um, you cannot keep this private forever because the whole point of a pre-registration is that you make your hypothesis, your commitment to this specific way of doing uh, your research publicly, but you can at least protect this for four years. So if you're for some reason worried about, I don't know, somebody else to, you know, learning from that for me, I, I do everything uh, publicly. Also, when you do everything publicly, you can, can create a DOI so people can cite you. Even before you actually collect the data or did anything, sometimes people would just want to cite the pre-registration. You would want to cite the pre-registration, but this really creates an official citation um, link between you and this pre-registration. So I also do, yeah, create a DOI. Why not? Let's go for it. So uh, it makes the pre-registration public uh, immediately. Uh, I, I just need to go on my phone and approve it. So excuse me for one second. Yeah. 
<clears throat> it's archiving, but at the end of the archive, uh, it should be uh, ready. Yeah, pending registration approval. So now I got the email, I'm gonna approve this on my mobile. To approve this registration, click the following, I'm clicking this, and then if everything goes well, um, yes, I sign in, and then I just do one more click. Yes, so now it has been approved, and now you can see that if I reload this, it will say, public registration. So anybody that's using this, so for example, if I uh, open an incognito mode and I uh, open this link, then you can see uh, this, uh, this uh, registration. In addition, you can see what project this was registered from. So you can actually go to, you know, under the tree, which is the original uh, one. Under this registration, you can actually go on the files and see exactly what my previous registration is. And you can see this is an archive. So in this archive, you can go in, you can go into the pre-registration and then click on the file that is the pre-registration. So now we have officially pre-registered. It took a few steps. Uh, you saw the document was not a very big one, uh, not a very long one, and it's based on a previous uh, research that we've done. So I just took what Lucas did. I did a few tweaks to uh, match what it is that we're doing in this workshop, and it's already ready. So within uh, five, 10 minutes, plus 10 minutes that I uh, took in order to adjust this for me for in 20 minutes, we've had a pre-registration publicly available to anyone on the Open Science Framework. Now, what does this look like? So I'm gonna ask you to participate in uh, a Mentimeter. Uh, let me see if I can find this. Where is my Menti? This is my Menti. Okay, so I'm going to present this to you and I want you to just consider how simple this experiment is. So this is the experiment. So I'm asking you to go on the Mentimeter uh, link here above and then enter that, um, enter this code 28751895. So if you go on menti.com and enter this code, you will be asked to participate in this one and the next and the next page. And I'm going to read uh, this scenario for you. And it's a very typical judgment and decision making scenario that was in norm theory with 3000 citations, just how easy this is. So what is the scenario? So we have Mr. Jones. Mr. Jones almost never takes hitchhikers in his car, but yesterday, he gave men a ride and was robbed. So a very unfortunate uh, result to uh, somebody who uh, deviated from never taking a hitchhiker, decided one day to give uh, a ride to a hitchhiker and then was robbed. Mr. Smith takes a lot of hitchhikers in his car. Yesterday, once again, he took a, a ride, a hitchhiker gave a hitchhiker a ride and was robbed. So both of them were robbed. One of them, um, um, always takes hitchhikers and one of them uh, never takes uh, hitchhikers. Both of them had exactly the same thing. So the main uh, question here is, who do you expect will experience greater regret over the episode? Is it Mr. Jones that never takes hitchhikers or is it Mr. Smith that frequently takes hitchhikers? So you can consider this uh, for a while and then we're gonna look at the, the results together. Uh, I've already pre-registered what the result is going to be. Uh, but the way, th so the design over here, it's a very interesting design. If uh, you are answering randomly, so the design here is like a one sample comparison test. So basically, if you're answering randomly, then it will be 50-50 here. So my test is to compare whatever the proportions from our little sample over here to 50-50. If it deviates from 50-50, um, to uh, in a meaningful, uh, meaningful effect, then we say that we found support uh, for, um, for for the hypothesis, and I'll tell you what the hypothesis is afterward. Okay, so this is this is the first one. What is the second one? It's uh, very very similar, only in a, a slightly different uh, design. Now we have a different scenario. Uh, we have two convenience stores, uh, and we have two uh, people, Mr. Paul and Mr. George. So two convenience stores are located in Mr. Paul's um, neighborhood. He frequently uh, visits store A 
more than store B. Last night, he visited store A, the one that's uh, more, more frequent. He walked in on a robbery taking place at the store and was shot. So um, he always goes there, then he goes there another night, and then he gets uh, shot. Now, so this is store A and store B. Now we have Mr. George with store C and store D. Uh, but the difference is, is that Mr. George actually goes to the store that he frequents less, but he had exactly the same result. So he walked in on a robbery and got shot. So for each one of those, I'm asking you to uh, rate the level of regret. So you're not comparing George to Paul, just saying who regrets more, but I'm asking you to give an actual number on what is the level of regret that uh, Paul uh, experiences over uh, the unfortunate outcome of visiting store and getting robbed compared to uh, George of the less frequently visited store D. Uh, um, what is the regret for Paul and what is the regret for George? Okay, so while you're thinking about this and answering this, uh, I'll go back to um, our pre-registration. So I'll open this uh, pre-registration. Okay, yeah. So what, is, what does norm theory actually mean? It just means it proposes that an abnormal behavior makes it relatively easy to think of what might have been. So the aim is to replicate this and the hypothesis is, we expect that the pattern of behavior, the past behavior affects regret. So if you deviated from your previous uh, behavior and something bad happened, you're going to regret this more or evaluate that as leading to stronger regret than if you just followed everything uh, to begin with. So if we look at um, uh, what, what it is that we ran over here is we're gonna look at the results. So all of you agreed that Mr. Jones actually is going to feel stronger regret than Mr. Smith. So we have a hundred zero. 100% versus 0%, I can promise you that's a very strong effect when you compare this to 50-50. So definitely you rated somebody who deviated from the norm as experiencing stronger regret over the unfortunate outcome. If we go to the uh, second one, you can see that the same kind of thing, but in a, in a, quali a more quantitative way uh, where we can do an in, uh, a dependent sample t-test. So all of you rated both of them, you rated both Paul and uh, George, and then um, uh, you all rated, uh, you know, if he visits, if he just keeps going with his regular routine and then something bad happens, then he doesn't regret this as much as somebody who deviated from the routine. How simple is this? It's very, very simple. And this is the first ever pre-register pre replication and extension that we did. Um, what did we do? So actually we can, um, we can go over here. Actually what I can do is that I can download these results. So I can have a look at these results. I can open these together with you. I'm gonna save this in the cloud folder. So afterwards, if you want, you can also uh, download this and you can see all this and you can export this to an Excel. So this is how Mentimeter uh, works. So we can save this. Yes. So we're gonna save this in the main directory and then we're gonna open this. And this is, the Menti has a, a, an interesting format. Yeah, it looks a little bit like that. So I feel like um, in the first one, we don't even need to do an analysis because all of you uh, agree that this is Mr. Jones. So it's a very significant effect. I don't think there, we even need to uh, look into it, but let's say that you wanted to look into it, we can open the R. So this was our data analysis plan. And you can see that basically I said, depending on what the sample is, if it's uh, smaller than 30, then we're gonna run the binome, um, uh, binome test. My computer is going a little bit slow. I hope I didn't, and um, you're still with me. Okay, uh, sometimes my computer freezes when there's too much going on. But actually, what you can see, I also gave some example. And over here, we had five. So we only had five. So five out of five, if we run this bi binomial, and we're comparing this to a 50-50. Uh, so of course, if, if we run this, 
uh, we have, it's a very, very small sample, but we have something that looks like a p-value that's very close to what it is that we hypothesized. So we had, uh, we had the results over there. In a similar way, we're going to run things, uh, you know, on Jamovi. Uh, but for now, because my computer is kind of like on, on, the, on the edge, I'm going to just say that there is this Jamovi here. We just take the, uh, you know, the findings that we have in this Excel. We put this into the data analysis plan in the Jamovi. And then we just run it and see what happens. So we've prepared, we've prepared uh, everything. And it seems like uh, from you know, the Mentimeter and what it is that we saw previously is that this is uh, you know, with a very small sample, seems to be in the right direction. I don't know if it's going to be significant or not, but definitely there's something, something going on over here. So that's nice. So we, we were able to replicate this, this finding. Now, the thing I wanted to share with you uh, about Lucas is that he actually uh, did something really interesting. So uh, he also replicated the hitchhiker scenario and the car accident scenario, which I did not include. And they replicated very well, just like you replicated this. So uh, 100 to zero or something very close in the original in Kahneman and Miller was about 92% versus 8%. So classic finding replicated this uh, uh, many times. The interesting thing is that since the 1980s, no one has ever replicated these scenarios. So uh, we weren't really uh, sure if this is gonna, we thought it might, but we needed like a well-powered sample in order to run this uh, kind of thing. But the interesting thing is that when we conducted the second one, actually the measure was not regret. The measure was a compensation. So if you recall in the, in the Menti actually, um, over here, if I show you again the scenario, actually what I wrote to you was uh, assume that there was no compensation, but actually in the original scenario, there was, there was a compensation and the compensation was actually the dependent variable. And Lucas was looking at this compensation and he said, I don't understand why this is about compensation when the actual, you know, the whole point of the article is about regret. Why did they measure compensation? Compensation is not like regret. So uh, we, should, we should measure regret. So I said to Lucas, this is terrific. So actually what you're suggesting is that we do an extension to the replication. So first you have to try and replicate. So we did the compensation. Then you move to the next page. So you don't touch the replication. And then you add an extension of regret. And this is what Lucas did. And the amazing thing is that he added, he added this measure of regret and it was extended. So we found support for regret. So what we realized is we did not find support for compensation. Maybe you need a larger, maybe it's a weaker effect. So you need a larger sample. You need to power this better. Um, but when we look at the original hypothesis of should be about regret, actually we found support for this regret. Even more interesting is that actually Dale Miller is very active. And when we sent this to him and he, we said, you know, it's interesting because we ran exactly what you ran in the 1980s. We tried both compensation and regret. Compensation didn't work, but regret did work. Uh, what do you say about this? And Dale said, yes, I, I remember many times when we ran compensation. You know, sometimes it worked, sometimes it didn't work. And it really depended on, on, you know, the it was generally a weak effect. But actually, you're right. This was supposed to be about regret. And then I asked him, so where are these null findings? Where can we see that compensation didn't work? And he said, no, when we submitted this to the journal, you know, it's... Um, uh, journals don't accept null findings. So can you imagine from the 1980s up until 2017, a lot of people probably tried compensation, but some of them never, you know, never got this result. So they said, maybe I did something wrong. Maybe I don't understand this. So I'm going to put this in my alpha draw and forget about this. So it could be a lot of people have been trying this. So we need to communicate this to the public so that they know that this is about regret and not about compensation. There's a question, can we replicate this type of study in another field by adapting questions in the experiment? Definitely. So uh, sometimes uh, people say maybe culture is interesting. So if you run this in Hong Kong or if you run this in the Netherlands or if you run this in the US, uh, maybe the culture affects the way that people perceive things. So one of the follow-ups that I did uh, later that year is actually looking at how social norms moderate this kind of effect. Some people might say, actually, I want to see, I don't care about hitchhikers or I don't care about stores. I care about something that's happening in an organization or something that happens about my participants. Then you can adjust this. However, when you do adjustments to the stimuli rather than to the sample, 
you are moving from what is called a direct close replication to a conceptual replication. So you're varying, you're already varying something that's very fundamental. So a direct replication tries to use exactly the kind of stimuli that was in, in the original without touching it. An extension is running the same stimuli, but then adding something afterwards. If you're only running something that's different, not just the, the original, this is already considered to be a conceptual replication. And then if it doesn't work, you're kind of, you're left wondering, is it because of my change or is it because the original doesn't work? So it's always best to start from a direct replication and then move to a conceptual replication. But just think about what this means. First of all, uh, you saw how simple this is. Some people ask me, what do you mean? This is a replication? This is not, this, this, I didn't even believe that you can do this kind of, um, yeah, a conceptual replication is just an extension, but extension comes on top of a direct replication. So uh, you add another, another uh, DV. Perfect question. Thank you, Kabiru. So uh, how easy is it to publish a replication study? You expected exactly my next slide. So Lucas also asked me, Lucas and the two other students, the first time that I told them we're going to run a pre-registered replication and extension, you know, open science, everything shared. They came to me and they said, you know, we've been studying psychology for a while. We've never read a published replication. So you think people will care about this? And I said, I honestly, I don't know. This is the first time that I'm running a replication. Um, so we, we need to try. This is what happened. I asked Lucas to go on ResearchGate. So you can see February 11, 2017. And Lucas wrote, the aim of this project before data collection, we didn't do anything. We didn't even do a pre-registration. We just told the community that we want to do a pre-registered replication extension. So Lucas wrote, the aim of this project is to conduct a pre-registered replication uh, of blah, 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 blah. The amazing thing is, is <laughs> a month later, Sander Cole, from the Free University of, of Amsterdam wrote, Dear Lucas and Gilad, add cognition and emotion. I don't know if you're familiar with this journal, but it's a very good journal. It's considered an aim in our field. Uh, where he was an incoming editor, we are seeking to publish more pre-registered research. Please consider us to be an outlet for this project. So can you imagine a master's student just writing something on ResearchGate and suddenly getting an incoming editor writing to them, they were so excited about this. And they came to me and said, oh my God, you know, look at what happened. This editor wrote, wrote to us. And I said, wait, hold on. From an invitation to submit up until this is published, it's gonna take a very long time. And some of the reviewers are very, are very uh, hostile. Uh, it's still, there's still some bias in the field against uh, replications. Um, but the interesting thing that happened is that, yes, a year and a half later, in cognition and emotion, we submitted this. Actually, I don't know if you're familiar, but Daniel Atkins uh, was the editor, the associate editor that was assigned to our manuscript because he was in charge of uh, getting more replications uh, reviewed for the, the journal. They gave us some uh, rough uh, uh, feedback, uh, but all very positive, constructive. Uh, we needed to conduct another um, you know, data collection, which we happily did because you can see how simple the data collection is. So you, you run a, a little adjustment. I think they were worried about, you know, order effects because we ran two studies together. So they wanted to know, is it that the second one, the compensation, did it fail because it came after the first one? So we said, no, it has nothing to do with that. We ran this again and got exactly the same results with without the order effects. So we convinced them that we've done everything or we could, everything shared, everything open. You can actually have a look at the, the, um, the link over here and see how we shared. Um, and then it was, it was published. And this was our first ever uh, pre-registered replication and extension. Now, um, Kabiru is asking also, I got more than seven rejections from my replication study, still trying. So first of all, um, let me know. I, I have some recommendations of which journals uh, might be accepted on this. I'll give you an example that now if you get rejected from a journal, uh, I don't know which one is you're submitting to, but let's say you get rejected and the only reason why they're rejecting you is because of contribution or theory or something that doesn't have to do with rigor. If you've done everything correctly, if you're well-powered, pre-registered, shared everything, you're rigorous, but they don't understand what is the value of replication, you can take your decision letter as is, 
and submit this to either Collabra Psychology or Meta Psychology, and they will not send this to an additional peer review. The editor will make a decision based on the other decision letter. And if the only reason is about theory or contribution, they will accept it as is. And we've done this already with two uh, replications. And now we, we have another one pending in Collabra Psychology. So now you have in psychology journals that are willing to focus on rigor and on replications. And if the only reason why it got rejected is because of all sorts of reasons that have nothing to do with rigor, this is publication bias and they're willing to take your work and publish this. So let me know what you've done. Uh, if you need some help and advice about which target journals, we have a lot of experience, let me know and I'll help you. Another question that uh, Kabiru asked is, uh, is there any journals in business that welcome replications? So this is a tricky business in business. It's uh, a management a literature is still very biased, but there is some hope because some journals, for example, MOR, which is the regional one here in Hong Kong, China, uh, Asia, uh, is accepting register reports. So register reports, if you submit this, and we'll talk about what register reports are, um, then register report, you submit your pre-registration for review. It's been reviewed before you've done any uh, data collection. And if they like it, they, uh, you and the reviewers agree that this is the best plan, then they give you an in-principle acceptance to that journal. And then whatever you collect, if it uh, failed or succeeded, whatever it is that you've done, you will get uh, this published. So you should consider registered reports with the Journal of uh, Business and Psychology or MOR, or I think Leadership Quarterly. Uh, there's a few of these uh, journals in uh, management that are picking up registered reports and are doing more of replication work. So this is just to show you that this is possible. You want to see more? No problem. Each one of my students, standard call, <laughs> went after them and said, Dear to Jen and Gilad at Cognition Emotion, Ya Jingao, you know. So three students, he went after them. They, he, you know, he didn't know about the connection between them. It wasn't because of me. He just was looking for replications because nobody was doing, nobody was doing replication at the time. So this is remarkable. In addition, uh, Lucas also did a pre-registered meta-analysis. Can you imagine that in a one-year master, because pre-registered replications are so structured and systematic, and so he did this in less than a semester, and then he had another semester, and he did a meta-analysis. So all three students in one-year masters for their thesis did a pre-registered replication plus a pre-registered meta-analysis. And not only were both of these uh, published, but we also published a third one, which was a review paper. So for a, a one-year master's student, Lucas, uh, we, we published uh, three, three of these um, based on his work. And the meta-analysis supported our, our replication. And what you can see over here is that the strongest effect is for regret, because this is uh, the, the closer alignment with the theory. But there is also victim compensation, which is about half of the other effect size. So you need much larger uh, samples. So if you want to uh, detect this effect, you would need to uh, compensate for power. So doing pre-registered replications and then pre-registered meta-analysis really brings together uh, uh, um, in-depth understanding of the literature, new insights, it really helps. And now people will know that if they are aiming for compensation, they need to look at, you know, they need to compensate with power. If they're looking at regret, likely to get uh, stronger power. And they can use these estimates and the one in the, in the replication for their power analysis in their follow-ups. And what I really like, and we've been doing this ever since, is that in the abstract, we already include the OSF plus a preprint. So some people only have, uh, they, they only have uh, access to... Uh, you know, the abstract, so they don't have access to the other thing. Uh, some people use all sorts of websites in order to overcome that. But if we include the OSF, OSF is open everywhere to everyone, and they can see all our materials, all our analysis, all the preprint before, you know, before the edits uh, and all that. So it really, it's very, it's very valuable uh, for uh, this kind of, of project. If you want to see more, uh, very welcome. I'm not going to go into this, but it's already in the directory. Uh, in this demonstration, 
um, that I, in the pre-registration and register report workshop, I did another demonstration of the default effect where we successfully replicated the default effect live in front of everybody with a pre-registration, just like we did here. So first I pre-register, then I, I conduct the data collection, then I show people the analysis that I do on that using uh, Jamovi and R. So you're very welcome to go deeper uh, into this. So um, now consider, um, you know, I, I, was, I was really thinking about this. So if I was able to do this one year, three students, we were able to, uh, to do all these wonderful pre-register replications and extensions, what, how can we do more of these replications that it would involve more people and we would maximize impact and some way to decrease error because, you know, I don't have all the solutions. And if it's a more complicated design, then perhaps there, we're going to run into um, more possibilities of getting things wrong. Um, and then this is when I decided to scale up. So with, with Lucas, uh, you know, the first one, uh, we did this together. So Lucas graduated and I submitted it to the journal. But at some point I became a little bit overwhelmed with work. So already here you can see I invited Adrian. Uh, so Adrian over here took over the work by Lucas and Kutcher. So I reached out on Twitter and I said, who wants to work with me to bring this wonderful pre-registered meta-analysis to publication? Adrian uh, did not know much about meta-analysis, but he was really enthusiastic about this. And we also worked on a different project, project before. So I invited, he was a master's student back then and said, come take our stuff and help us to submit this. And we've been doing more of these. So I decided I'm going to run as many of these as I can. I'm going to involve as many people as I can. I'm going to try and maximize impact and I'm going to try and reduce error. So some people would take what I do with my students. I would invite early career researchers and they would go and verify everything that we've done. And then we submit this to the journal. So I did this with Yajin Gao and Tijan. Um, uh, we, we, uh, fin they finished their thesis and then they graduated. So they uh, didn't really care much about publications anymore. But yeah, we submitted these uh, replications and extensions. We submitted this re replications and extensions, not to cognition and emotion, we wanted to see, can we submit this to uh, well-known journals in social psychology? So we submitted this to Journal of Experimental Social Psychology. And I invited, so in SIPS, the Society for Improvement of Psychological Science, I invited uh, Ignacio here and he came and he took over with another early career researcher. He took over my work with the guided uh, thesis student with Yajin. And then John, who uh, did his uh, PhD, he's still doing his PhD, and we were together uh, classmates five years ago. Um, he, I invited him and he took over the other uh, replication. So the model that I've developed is I'm going to run as many of these as I can with my students. And then we're going to invite somebody else to come in and verify everything, make sure that it's submission ready, make sure that everything is, is solid. And then we submit this to the journal. And then I realized this model works. Uh, we can do pre register replications and extensions, and we can submit this to uh, top journals in social psychology, and these can be published. So not everything works. Uh, I am going to admit we get rejections. Every time you submit a manuscript to uh, good journals, you might get a rejection. But by now, we've done a lot of these. Last year, we were able to do 15 of these. So 15 uh, more, I think 20 early career researchers joined us in order to take over what we've been doing with the students and then submit this to the, to the journals. My summary of this section, where are we? Yeah, yeah. okay. So my summary of this uh, section is, if you wanna get started on this, I was clueless. I didn't know what I was doing. I just tried different things and I'm very lucky that these things worked. So I suggest to you, Let's say you don't know how to do open science. You don't know how to share everything. You don't know what is a pre-registration. You have no clue how to run replications. No problem. Just start doing it hands-on. And I strongly recommend because a lot of people are saying, but I have my research and I already got my grant. And then I already involved in 30 different projects. I don't have time for this. So my recommendation is start with guided students. If you are a student, no problem. Guide somebody else. You know, if uh, some of the students that are working with me are, are teaching assistants in my in my courses and they are guiding undergraduates. So if you're a master's student, an MPhil student, a PhD student, no problem. You have people in the lab, guide them, do it through them. So if they're starting a project, get them to start doing it right and learn by doing things with them. Until now, 
It's been four years since I started this. I'm learning so much from the students. It's amazing how much I'm learning from them. They do so well. They go out, they learn new things, new techniques. And then I learn by collaborating with them. So I really recommend that you start with guided students. Another question. Is it possible to conduct a mini meta analysis of the original research and replicated study as my contribution? Yeah, it's, uh, it's definitely possible. Uh, and we, we do this in some of our replications. Uh, so if you go on our preprints, you will see that many of them actually have uh, a mini meta. So you're very welcome to uh, go learn from that, use the citations, use the way that we frame this. Sometimes uh, replication by itself is enough of a contribution, but especially if you inform something about the estimated effect size, you combine a few of these studies to say, we thought the effect is this strong, but actually it's weaker. Or sometimes we actually found that the effects are stronger than the, in the original. So getting a, a more accurate estimate of the effect size is very valuable and very needed in the literature. My recommendation is, you saw how simple this is. So most of the judgment and decision-making, the classics in the 1970s, this is, this is Nobel Prize winning work. Kahneman won, is the only psychologist to ever win the Nobel Prize in economics. So some people would say, but this is too easy. This, is, this doesn't seem like it's valuable. It's very valuable because actually from these vignettes, from this kind of experimental design, people followed up in the field and they were able to extend this. So if you know the deviation from a reference point, the deviation from past behavior, a deviation from status quo, a deviation from default, a deviation from something might lead you to stronger regret if something goes bad, this has implications. And later, perhaps you're familiar with Nudge. So in 2017, uh, the, the Nobel Prize in economics went to, to Richard Rich. Uh, about the nudge theory. Um, you can read nudge in the book that he has with Cass Sunstein. So uh, this has later led to all sorts of practical implications on how we can use this in order to inform people and get people to, to choose uh, better for them to lead a, a more healthier, well-balanced, sustainable life. So I suggest start with something very, very simple. Start with a replication. You'll learn a lot from that. If you want, Take our replication, just take it as is. We now have a hundred of these. We've completed a hundred. Take one of these, use our Qualtrics, use our pre-registration, add a different extension, build on that, move forward, submit this somewhere as a register report, and, and then uh, learn, learn from, from that. Actually, right now in Brazil, our collaborators in Brazil are taking our uh, projects, and are, the only thing that they're actually doing is translating this to Portuguese. So they're gonna run this with their own samples. So we're gonna take a replication, a replication in Brazil, in Portuguese. If it works, amazing. Doesn't work, we've learned something. So start simple. Go on Open Science Framework, go on my website, see what we've done, take this, adjust this, super simple design. You can run this, doesn't even need a very, very large samples. I think the key ingredients, which is what I've learned from this is to rely on examples. So. The first one, you know, Lucas and Tijen and Yajin, they didn't have any templates, they didn't have any examples, they didn't have anything. But now we do. Now we have a lot of examples. Now we have a lot of templates. We've built uh, guides and videos. I want to show you uh, all the things that, that we have. I'll show you not all of them, but I'll show you some of them. Um, so, for example, if you'll go here to the Get Involved in Resources, so you'll see, for example, that we have uh, templates for uh, how to write a replication and extension uh, main manuscript or how to write a supplementary. So if I click on this, if I just open this, this is a Google Doc, and you'll see just how comprehensive this is. So you can see, you can see all, the, all the process here. Um, you can uh, duplicate this, uh, take this as is, change whatever it is that you want, and it takes you really step by step. It looks like a manuscript, it's ready, it tells you exactly what to insert where, it has all the best practices, so for example, a, con a contribution uh, with co-authorship, uh, with credit, um, and then it looks, you know, with simple instructions. So for example, the abstract, it tells you exactly what you need to do. So this is how our undergraduates are able to do so well with their replications and extensions. They just follow our templates. They follow our guides. They follow step-by-step -step instructions on what this should look like. So we tell you exactly in each section, what is it that you should do? Sometimes you just need to you know, tackle the highlights. 
uh, why did you choose this study? We already gave you some framing. We give you the citation so you can go and have a look at this. Um, the, the extension, the original hypothesis, uh, the tables that you need in order to do this, we give you some, some guidance. So basically it's replacing what needs to be uh, replaced, deleting what is not relevant for your own uh, replication, adding whatever information you need, uh, making sure that everything is solid in the methods uh, section, lots of instructions over here, things that are relevant for replications. So just take it and use it, it's all open. If something you see in the, uh, in this template that you think should be improved, uh, you can help us uh, improve this. You can, everything is, is editable. You can comment or you can actually go ahead and suggest something. Add, add your name on the top. Tell us that you've added this, that you've made this better. And when we submit this to the journal, you can also be a co-author. So everything is open. Everything is collaborative. Everything is uh, the community. Okay, so the first part was aimed to give you a taste. I really wanted before I start, you know, with the blah, blah of what open science and, you know, replication crisis, maybe some of you are already familiar. I really wanted to show you a little bit of that. And I wanted to tell you about my own journey of how I got into this because I want you to feel like this is doable. A lot of early career researchers and students just feel completely overwhelmed and it seems like a, a, a big journey and like it's very, very complicated. So really you can you can do this. You can start simple, you can build on examples, templates and guides, uh, and you can do this on your own, even without your PIs, even without your advisor, you can uh, take the first step and, and start. If you want, you can also join us or join some of the other teams that are by now in the open science community, there's quite a few teams. For example, there's the Psychological Science Accelerator. By now there's 70, more than 70 teams from around the world. So they will tell you what to run. You join a large team, you're a collaborator, you're gonna be one of, I don't know, a hundred uh, co-authors, but you run data collection and an analysis on your uh, data collection and you become a contributor. You can uh, join a um, CREP that also does replications with, uh, with students. So they will tell you what study to run. They will even give, give you the materials. They will give you some guidance and then you can just run the replications with them. You can also do study swaps. So if there's something that you specialize in, you go on study swap and you'll see a lot of people are saying, this is what we plan to do. Who can help us? Who can do data analysis? Who can do data collection? So you don't have to do all the project yourself. You don't have to learn just by looking at videos and trying hands-on. You can just work with others. And you can, of course, especially if you're at HKU in Hong Kong in this region, very, very welcome, very easy to work with us. There's so many projects and things that you can join. Uh, just, just tell me what works for you. So very, very briefly, I'm going to uh, describe what it is that led me to the feeling that we need to reassess, to self-reflect and improve the way that we do uh, research. In 2002, uh, 2015, 2016, uh, a, lot of, a lot of findings came out saying uh, the things that we thought are reliable don't replicate. So I think you're familiar with the power posing, um, Amy Cuddy, very famous TED talk, uh, New York Times bestseller and so forth. Elderly priming, all of the social priming about unscrambling sentences and so forth doesn't replicate very well. And this is one that's close to my heart because these are people that I've collaborated with and know very well about ego depletion. Uh, so I was especially interested in this self-control uh, um, as a limited resource is what we refer to as ego depletion. And it's uh, very, very disappointing for us that this does not seem to be a reliable phenomenon, despite hundreds of articles, thousands of citations. So very disheartening uh, finding is in 2015, 2016. But the big paper is the one that came out in science. I'm guessing that if you're here, you're familiar with this. Uh, Brian Nostek from the Center of Open Science has been tweeting a lot about all kinds of different investigations, trying all kinds of things. So many labs too. And these are replications from nature and science and you know, things that are related to psychology and social sciences. So overall, this is what Brian Nostek is, is summarizing. Overall, the replication rate for these mass collaborations is about uh, half. And in this half, it's about uh, half, the effect size is about half of the original. Since then, we've had a lot of disappointments. Uh, these things are mass replication projects that are published in either perspectives of psychological science or advances in, uh, of uh, methods and practices in psychological science. So uh, two big journals, lots of collaborators uh, on each one of those. And these are classics, honesty priming, priming hostility priming. You know, this uh, 1979 paper, 
two mass replications because we just we couldn't believe that this thing doesn't doesn't replicate well two mass replication uh thousands of citations very very disappointing uh and also finding big errors just ima imagine that from the 1979 nobody really looked at the statistics over that to to see that th these statistics just don't make sense so somebody should revisit this and when we revisit this it doesn't replicate so all these are very disappointing uh, priming embodiment verbal framing uh, all sorts of things about like uh, discussed so very disheartening uh, overall. I usually give like a whole half an hour of this thing, but I'm gonna make this short and just say that at least in social psychology, the replication rate seems to be somewhere between 30% and 50%. And in the stuff that replicates is about half of uh, the original. Now, typically what we get is, uh, you know, the feedback that we got from others in 2015, 16 is that this is a psychology problem. I want to make it very clear that by now we understand that this is not a psychology problem. This is a science problem. This is a big problem that we have to deal with. Uh, in the last few years, I've been working with people in biology, in medicine, in different fields. Uh, they come to psychology in order to learn from us how to do all sorts of things. We work together on collaborative guides. And now we understand we have a real issue here. Um, and all these headlines have been coming up. You know, the medicine has a problem, chemical research, uh, cancer, cancer research is broken, even empirical computer science has, has problems. This is I, really heartbreaking to, to see this. I try and keep track of this by updating the, you know, whatever comes out, you know, especially cancer biology, this is happening right now. The replication rates are very, are very, very bad. So it's not just the social sciences, even in the hard sciences, based on very, very initial uh, findings, uh, whatever it is that we uh, do know doesn't look uh, very good. We talked a little bit about neuroscience. This is just one study, one replication study, but we have a very hard time replicating neuroscience uh, findings because very small samples, very underpowered, very noisy measurements, uh, and a lot of flexibility in the way that people do things. So, um, we really need to take this into consideration and just, first of all, understand that we need to do more replications and then that we really need to work on doing open science. So this was like the very, very short version of why I think we are in need of re-examining. If you want to know more about this, there's like a whole course about this on YouTube where I explain this and visit this together with uh, my students in my courses. So what is this open science and how does this address uh, this situation? Um, and for me, and I, I really like this, uh, John passed away, unfortunately, I think it was a motorcycle accident, but he did amazing work. He formed this, uh, this group of open science. Uh, and, and then I, I love their slides and I like the simple messages that they have that open science is just like science done right. I don't, I don't even understand, you know, coming into academia, and seeing the way that science is, seeing the kind of reviews that I get, seeing the kind of uh, you know uh, paywalls that I have in order to access all kinds of information when I'm not on campus or when the campus is not wealthy uh, and has access to all the publishers, just seeing all these things in academia, um, I was just like thinking to myself, oh my god, this is how science works. This is this does not feel like science. This closed science is is seems so far removed from what I thought science would be before coming in to the PhD. But I have to say, the longer you are in the system, somehow you're being brainwashed that this is okay. But we need to understand that closed science is not okay. This is a, a deviation from what science is supposed to be, the ideals of, of science. And I feel like you know we should just go back to the foundations and think, what should science be? At its very core, it has to be open, it cannot, uh, be, be closed. It cannot be paywalled. It cannot be every person for uh, him herself. So I love this uh, uh, slide from Simin Vazir. Uh, she is currently the editor of Collabra Psychology. Before that, she was the editor of SPPS and the president. Uh, no, I think she's very involved with the initiator of the Society for Improvement of Psychological Science. And she's an advocate. She's considered one of the, the strongest figures, I think, in the open science uh, movement or whatever you want to call this credibility revolution or science reform. Uh, and I like the way that she differentiates between what is currently the status of science about this incredible. So you want to publish in nature and science? It has to be incredible. It has to be this 
innovation extraordinary this massive uh, and of course it needs to be positive uh, findings but if you look at a science nature paper it almost it doesn't have any uh, details in there so there's like maybe three pages in there the supplementary has a few more but very little shared very little understanding of the methodology if you try to reproduce anything from from that um, very very difficult therefore when you read the papers, they're so brief. It really reads like an advertisement. It basically says, trust me that I did something amazing. Take my word for it, you know? And then there are all sorts of biases in there, you know, so where you come from, what your status is, what you, you know, your affiliation, place in the world and all that. There's all sorts of things about status. Um, and it seems like the same kind of people keep getting what's called all the glory. They keep getting the, the, the most attention. Uh, novelty, all time, everything has to be significant. Uh, and unfortunately, when we revisit many of these findings, we, we, find, we find errors. Um, there are some teams right now that are dedicated to finding errors in publications. And now we understand that actually there's, the higher the impact factor, the bigger the problems that you have because there's uh, very little transparency. Um, so we need to move from this incredible culture into credibility, where we do everything transparently, where we declare our conflicts of interest, uh, where all the contributions are credited. Did you use a package in R? Did you use some tool? Did you involve somebody in order to do data collection? Everybody needs to be acknowledged. Everybody needs to be credited. Uh, maybe you didn't find what it is that you set out. People need to, do, uh, to, to know about this so that they won't repeat your errors. And then when we do an aggregation, when we do a meta-analysis, will have a more uh, precise estimate of, of the effect size. So we need to be able to catch errors. We need to be able to issue corrections, uh, revisit ourselves. So science is not a religion. It's not a, you know, a folk belief. It's not something that we should just blindly uh, trust because of some authority or because of some uh, other, other reason. Uh, it should be based on credibility from you know, the core from how it's conducted, from how it's been reported, from the rigor, from the methods, from the theory, from the measurements, you know, so all these uh, matters. So we really need to emphasize uh, credibility. I really like this paper from uh, Munafo, the, the British uh, reproducibility team. They do an amazing job over there. So uh, if you look at the, the life cycle, uh, typically what we have is that we generate some hypothesis, then we design a study, then we conduct the study, then we analyze the data, then we integrate the results, then we publish this and uh, think about the next uh, experiment. The problem is, is that currently uh, we have a problem in each one of these uh, steps. So we have a bias in the way that we move from a hypothesis to our designs. Then up until 2015, we had very small samples. Even now, you know, neuroscience and some of the medical sciences have very small samples and we need to think what to do uh, in that sort of thing. So now neuroscience, now medical science, now all the sciences that know that they have very small samples understand that they need to mass collaborate. It's not only the physicists that need to come together in order to do the CERN uh, you know, over there in Switzerland. We also researchers have to come together. So you do the sample that you can uh, you work with another lab, they do the sample that they can. And then we really need to put our resources uh, together. Then when we conduct the study, collect the data, there's very poor quality control because we've never pre-registered anything. We're just like uh, wing it, you know. First, I'll, I'll run the EEG, the neuroscience. First, I'll run the experiment. I'll see, I'll decide later if it's a pilot or not a pilot. So there's no real plan. It's more like winging it. You know, it's, I'll, I'll get there after I see the, the results and then I'll decide, you know, what it was. But then sometimes after you look at the, at the results, you're, you're kind of deciding maybe, oh, you know, I found this, but I didn't, I didn't find what I wanted to find. But if something else came significant, so now I should adjust my hypothesis without actually being transparent about uh, changing my hypothesis. So pretending like this was my hypothesis all, all along, and this is what's called hypothesis in, uh, hypothesizing after the results are known, harking. And then uh, we don't have any replications, so everything is just novel, novel, novel. Nobody ever revisits. Findings from the 1980s, norm theory 3000 citations, we still don't know that compensation doesn't work as well is regret and is about half of the 
estimated effect size, but sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. So almost 40 years, no, nobody ever took the time in order to, to revisit this, or maybe they did, but they never submitted this to the journals, or maybe they did, and the journals never accepted this. So not doing replication, not submitting this to the journals, the journals not publishing replications, all of this life cycle is broken. And we need to address all of this. And open science tries to address each and every step of, of this uh, sort of cycle. So um, you analyze, you know, you, you do a pre-registration, you decide of, of your data analysis plan in advance, what your hypotheses are, how to best address this in terms of your uh, design. Then if you can, perhaps you crowdsource things in your design. So maybe you, you didn't do a perfect design. So we crowdsource, we have typically when we do our replication, we have two teams of two students working independently and then they peer review one another. So really trying your best to so no one person can ever uh, have all the knowledge. We're doing all kinds of checks and balances, crowdsourcing, doing open peer review in order to have other people go over our designs. Then when you conduct a study, you collect the data, just being very open about this, you know, the way that you can mass collaborate with other people. Um, all of these things, you know, a lot of these steps are being addressed by doing a pre-registration or doing a register reports. And finally, you know, the problems with paywalls or the problems with uh, publishing, just putting things, first of all, as preprints. So let's say that even if you didn't get published at the journal, you still have a preprint, can be cited, can, can be found. And we do a meta-analysis, people will know that it's, that it's there. Uh, and slowly we're moving, you know, COVID, if we always waited until something would get published in the big journals, COVID would never have a, a solution this fast. Uh, preprints are what makes uh, things move faster so that others can see the kind of work that's been done and, and learn from that. So that teams that are addressing this sort of thing, especially now when we're thinking about vaccines and what is the efficacy, what are the risks, we need to communicate things faster and we need reliable things, not just you know big headlines, media, uh, scare, uh, you know, all sorts of statistics, but we need verifiable, peer-reviewed sharing of knowledge where a lot of people, many labs from around the world come together and share the knowledge that they have, and then science can move uh, much faster. I really like this uh, paper. It's, uh, there's also a, a presentation on this. It's the seven easy steps uh, for open science. This is a reading list. And it addresses all the elements of open science. Uh, so it addresses, so Munafo, we already saw, this is the Munafo paper. So they took one paper in each one of the categories that is under this open science umbrella, and then they review it. They try to help you understand it. So if you're an early career researcher, if you're somebody that wants to understand what is open science step-by-step, step, um, so Sophia over here, she uh, is one of the initiators of the reproducibility, and she does some really interesting uh, work. So she is, she is heading this together with a lot of other, uh, um, uh, sorry, Amy Urban and Sophia uh, work together a lot. Sam Parsons is also in there. So all of these are very prominent figures in the open science uh, community. Uh, very inspiring to learn from them. And I think they did a really good job. So if you're interested in open access, read this. If you're uh, interested in open uh, data, then Klein, um, they did a really, a really good job over there. So each one of these things, basically we're tackling open access, open data, reproducible analysis, pre-registrations, replication research, and then teaching open science. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit later about what I think is the right way to teach open science. And I can, we can talk a lot about that because we've been doing all sorts of things here at HKU and under this uh, umbrella of open scholarship, you can find all these little uh, details uh, afterwards. Um, here under this also they added, and I think this is important because this is now a big issue uh, with the Twitter storm that's happening right now about equity, diversity, and inclusion to really ensure that anybody can join, that everybody has access, that it's not some elitist organization that you know just tells others what to do, but everybody can have a voice come in and contribute from wherever you are in the world, whatever your origin, race, gender, the sexuality, the, you know, the, from all, all sorts of, um, from all, all places in the world, from all um, levels of your career, if you're an undergraduate or you're a journal editor, full professor, even if you're not in academia, 
The nice thing about SIPS, for example, that I really like about SIPS uh, is that it's one of the only uh, conferences that I know of where uh, really people sit together in a round table working on real solutions without really much regard to what the status is, where people come from, who they are, what they're about, but rather just like letting everybody take take part in this kind of initiative. So if you want to know more about this, uh, this is a new initiative, Center of Open Science together uh, with the uh, Open Science, Science Knowledge Base. So go on this uh, knowledge base and see how they tackle each and every one of these uh, things about how to collect data, how to plan, do pre-registrations, uh, how to do theory, how to disseminate, how do you teach, how do you publish, um, I use many of these resources for my own, uh, in my own uh, courses with, with my students. I also um, appreciate this, this kind of pyramid that comes from the Center of Open Science and Brian Osek, um, because it shows the different uh, levels that we need to tackle if you really want open science to be a cultural uh, change. At the beginning, we didn't even have things that would make this possible. So Brian Osek with the Center of Open Science are the ones that made the open science framework possible. So now we can share, now we can do pre-registration. So now doing open science is possible. The question is of course, how to make it easy. So how do we help uh, newcomers really uh, go through the journey? So people like me work on templates or uh, uh, you know, workshops, uh, helping people through, through this journey. And because the stuff that we do is collaborative, then anybody can come in, first of all, use this, but also contribute, and then it grows as, as a community, then you make it normative and make it rewarding. So there's a lot to do, especially if you're a senior scholar and you have power, you want to take steps in order to make open science not only uh, easy possible in your department, but also to make it rewarding so that people would not be afraid of, of doing open science because it would hurt their career. And I'll talk a little bit later about why it would not hurt your career. So now finally, open science is coming to a place where you can publish, you can work as a community, you can have impact uh, and it contributes to, to your own career. And I'll give you some indications of that. I really feel that at the end, it needs to be uh, required um, in order to make sure that our science is reliable. Can you just imagine what would happen if you know, the research in, on COVID is, is not is not reliable. So it doesn't matter if you're doing COVID or you're doing neuroscience or you're doing social psychology, we want to ensure that uh, taxpayers' money is invested correctly, that the public is well informed and it's based on solid, reliable, trustworthy science. So at some point after we've tackled all of these things, we also need to make it required. So hopefully if you're an early career researcher, 10 years from now, all of the things that seem so difficult for us right now would be common practice uh, and would be uh, required. Uh, they would be the default uh, so that we would all follow this from the beginning. This is a, a very nice pyramid by Chris Chambers. Chris Chambers, like I said, is uh, currently an editor in many journals in neuroscience. He's the person who promoted register reports, and then he promoted exploratory reports, and then he uh, promoted assessment reports. So there's all sorts of things that he initiated. He's really driving forward our science. And I agree with this hierarchy of register reports being the best that we have. We're gonna touch on this later, but just like I explained in the break, a register reports is basically taking your pre-registration so let's say, for example, this um, demonstration that I gave to you. Before I do the Mentimeter and before I collect the data, what I would do is I would take my pre-registration plan and I would send this to the journal. And in the journal, I would say, revisiting, doing replications and extensions of norm theory is really important. This is how I'm planning to do this. And then this is sent to peer review before any uh, data collection. Peer reviewers go over this and then we need to agree that this is the best plan. And once we do, they give me an in-principle acceptance. Then I collect the data, I write the results, I document uh, all the deviations from the pre-registration and justify them. But basically I just follow the pre-registration plan and then it is published in the journal. So we've done uh, a few of these right now. 
Uh, you can go on our website and see how we've done this. Uh, an example for one journal that does only register reports in social psychology, it's called Comprehensive Results of Social Psychology. But by now you have 270 journals from different disciplines, especially psychology, but not only, uh, that have register report track. So if we consider the uh, pyramid of evidence, the current status quo research with this underpowered study, not pre-registered, you know, all sorts of uh, things in there that emphasize positive p-value lower than 0 0.05 with very little transparency, a lot of flexibility. This is status quo research, and I agree with Chris Chambers that this is barely worth a mention. So when I need to communicate to students, to practitioners, the knowledge that we have in the field, I don't regard this as being solid enough. And we really need to move towards having at least some level of open science. So maybe it's not pre-registered, but I have access to all the data and materials. And this is a little bit better because then we can verify, we can see there is some transparency in there. Pre-registration is important for conformatory open science. So you're not just playing around, exploring, seeing what works, you know, running all the correlations or just seeing you know, lots of DVs and let that see which one of them works. But once you've found something, then you repeat this and you try to confirm your predictions once again to see that this was not like a random false uh, positive, but there's a consistent pattern over there. So pre-registration is really addressing you not fooling yourself, you not... Uh, um, uh, just just finding uh, random noise, making sense of, of uh, something that really uh, isn't in there. But on top of that is a register report, and on top of that, a meta-analysis of register reports. So hopefully in a decade or two, we'll have our best practices. It would be a meta-analysis of register reports. So we really need to move in that direction. And this is what should carry the most weight. If you consider what's happening in medicine, so whenever you do a clinical trial, um, uh, then you need to register this in a public place on how, how you do this. Perhaps you have a, a public advisory team of external reviewers that go over your data. Many of the companies that did the COVID vaccines, uh, if they've done this transparently, did not even have access to uh, the data uh, up until, you know, so it was deposited to somebody else that was in charge of keeping track on that and communicating this transparently uh, to, to the public. I added a few things on top of that because we're trying to do also meta-analysis register reports. So the top of everything would be a registered report, meta-analysis of register report. And on top of everything uh, on that would be one not that you published one in 10 years, you know, meta-analysis, then update another 10 years, but something that keeps updating all the time. So if you have more data coming in on COVID, you know, it keeps updating the meta-analysis. So every point in time, every new thing that comes in automatically updates the meta-analysis. And there's now a direction of continuously automatically updated registered report meta-analysis of registered reports. So I think this is where, you know, we should aim for. So if you're an early career researcher, I am not really sure this would be a uh, standard during my time, but I'm hoping that it would be in your time. Uh, but this is uh, what I consider to be best, best practices. Another, uh, so we talked about in the beginning, I showed you uh, one of the videos I recommended was easing into open science and they've shown this road and they try to take you in this road, what kind of steps you can take, but the what, the why, the how, <laughs> and all sorts of uh, worries. And they separate this into easy things that you can do, medium things that you can do, and hard things that you can do. Their first recommendations, you've heard my recommendations, just start doing things. But some people find this overwhelming. Therefore, it's best to uh, interact with others who are doing similar things. So one of the recommendations is just join a journal club. So Reproducibility has over 70 teams from around the world who meet um, together to discuss different readings or different projects uh, or, you know, they have different speakers. So you can join a journal club or if you're um, still waiting for the person that would build this in Hong Kong, start a journal club here in Hong Kong. There's a very active one in Taiwan. Not sure exactly what's happening in mainland China, but this region needs more 
Uh, the one in Singapore is really active and doing some uh, terrific work. Um, another thing that you can do is just like document your workflow. Uh, you can start with OSF. So OSF also has a wiki. So every time you do something, you can upload a new file or you can update the wiki. Uh, if you don't want this to be public, you can still keep this as, as something that's private. And another very easy step is, did you do a thesis? That's terrific. Just upload this as a preprint. So um, Alison, for example, who is one, a member of our, our team that's working on systematic reviews and meta-analysis, she finished her thesis a few weeks ago and she uh, uploaded this as a, as a preprint uh, thesis comments and then also submitted this to uh, the journal uh, to meta psychology. So uh, her sharing this as a preprint allowed me to also go on Twitter and say, have a look at this preprint. And then she got a lot of feedback, people from experimental philosophy, social psychology. So if you don't share this preprint, even though you've done a thesis and you think maybe, you know, um, nobody would care, there's not enough interest, how do you know? Sometimes these theses are very, very valuable. And just share this with the community and, you know, perhaps something will come out of it. Somebody will invite you for a collaboration. Perhaps some journal would be interested in this and then you can convert from a preprint into a publication. So Meta Psychology is one example of a, a, a journal that forces you, Meta Psychology forces you to put this as a preprint and actually it calls on open peer review. So the peer review for the journal Meta Psychology happens on the preprint, which is remarkable. So it means that we really need to move into a, a structure where first we share everything, we get as much feedback as possible. And then the publication is just a, a step saying that we've verified this enough that we trust this to say that we've reached some conclusion. Start from a preprint. Then if you want to do a little bit uh, more than that, I understand that some people have concerns about sharing data. I remember how hesitant I was about sharing data. So what happens if somebody uh, you know, finds an error, somebody would think that I'm stupid or that I don't know what I'm doing. And then it took me some time to realize like, oh my God, what if I have an error and nobody knows about this? And like in 20 years, somebody will find, find out about this. So it's best for you to share data as early as possible because you want others to find, find your errors. So all the things that I worried about was just like a very strange biased, uh, concerns that I don't know where they came from that were completely twisted about uh, sharing data. I want people to visit my work. I want people to find errors in my work. I want them to find this as early as possible, not after it's published, not after 20 years after people invested millions in this. And then after this, we, we realize that I've made a stupid mistake, but let's find this uh, uh, in advance. So share as early as possible. At the beginning, I had this concern about maybe somebody will uh, scoop me, somebody will steal from me as if it's like my own. They didn't use taxpayers' money. So I had all these conceptions about, oh, it's mine, it's mine, and I don't want anybody. It's like this race. Now I understand it's not a race. First of all, it's my obligation to the taxpayers, to the people who support me and my research. It's my obligation to make the most of this, of this data. So I share as much as possible, hoping that other people would use this. Because I share this, it comes with the DOI. So now people can cite me. I can also claim that I am the first because I have proof for this, because it is a, a timestamp that says when I share this. So actually, by sharing things, first I enable other people to cite me and, and use this and share and build wonderful things, invite me for collaboration. But it also protects me because then people know that sharing data um, you know, I've done this. I was the first to share this data. If there's any conflict at some point about this. Reproducible code, that's something that I think a lot of people are still struggling with. Uh, I don't know what you're using. Are you using SPSS, uh, Jamovi, Jasp, R? Uh, this, is, this is a tricky bit. Uh, reproducible code uh, is still something that I'm struggling with. Because for example, if you use R, R depends on all kinds of uh, packages. And these packages sometimes go in and out of CRAN. Sometimes they change their API. So, you know, code that ran before doesn't run now. Sometimes you uh, put this on some kind of a website that simulates R, uh, but then that website uh, changes uh, Docker or whatever other um, 
our studio cloud that, that you use to reproduce. Uh, but now we have more and more packages that allow for better reproducible code. So that would uh, document what package version you're using and then be able to run your environment in exactly the same way uh, so that let's say in five years, if you run the same code, it will run exactly as you ran it in your, um, so there's lots of good talks about this, for how to do reproducible code. Jamovi uh, and Jasp, uh, Jasp kind of take care of that, but I've already seen that sometimes Jasp and Jamovi uh, change things and break the compatibility, the backwards compatibility a little bit. So this is something that the community still need to, needs to work out. Um, but it's just like open open source. So GitHub and other thing is we need to work at solutions in order to make sure that everything is reproducible, not just for now, but also for later. But at the very least, Jamovi um, and R enable you to uh, save the output so that you will always be able to see what the outputs are. And there's also this meshing between the code and the text with R markdown and all sorts of exciting directions over there. Uh, Pre-registration, I think now we know how to do this. I don't know why it's in medium. If our undergraduate second year can do this, I feel like everybody can do this. A lot of people think pre-registration is difficult. Um, I think there's one famous paper, Brian Ossick and somebody else, uh, maybe Tim Arrington, I can't remember, that uh, pre-registration is hard but valuable uh, and important. But I don't think that it's hard uh, if you have good templates. If you try this a few times, then you'll see the pre-registration pre is actually just like writing a manuscript. It's, you just move it from the end to uh, the beginning. I agree that hard registered reports are difficult um, at the beginning, but they make it much easier uh, at the end. And they're saving actually a lot of time. Systematic reviews are tricky. Well, uh, if you want, there's a whole other workshop uh, on that. I won't touch on this. Um, I just want a, a little bit of evidence you know, in favor of open science. So some people are saying uh, at the beginning, there's a lot of pushback from sometimes senior uh, people or people that don't really like the idea of open science saying, so what evidence do you have? First of all, what evidence do you have that there's a problem? So now we see the replication rates or we see other issues that indicate all sorts of things like questionable research practices. But they're saying, okay, but this is like part of science. How do you know that open science does better? And now we know that it does better. So for example, if we consider pre-registration or register reports, does it really help? Now we know that it does. So if you consider, for example, this uh, one over here about money, money priming, if you look at the meta-analytic uh, summary over here of the published lit lit literature, the studies, there's 174 effects over here. Overall, the indication of, is of a hedges G of uh, 0.35. I would say this is like a medium uh, effect. Definitely uh, would conclude uh, back 10 years ago, they would conclude, yeah, money priming works, no problem. The problem is, is that if you do a funnel plot and you look at this, uh, what you realize is that there's lots of missing studies over here that probably indicate some publication bias. The thing is with register reports, pre-registered studies that are published no matter what the outcome is, is that if you do pre-registered replications of money uh, effects and you run this, and this is now we have 51 of those, you see that it falls exactly on this triangle the way that it should be. And that the center of it is an effect of 0 0.02. So if you do a pre-registration, you don't see any indication for publication bias and it is as it should be uh, this uh, wonderful, uh, this wonderful triangle, but then you find no effect. So uh, this really helps you, uh, you know, do things correctly without the publication uh, bias. In addition, number two is, uh, do you find support for the first hypothesis? Yes or no? So in the standard report, everything is positive. Just like look at how insane high this is over here. But register reports, no findings are acceptable. And sometimes, you know, it's closer to it's even under, 50% uh, it ranges, but it's like about half, half. So you can read a little bit more about this. I think it's already published in ALPPS. So uh, very interesting um, study uh, and over here. Uh, men medical sciences, I think this was what, uh, some clinical trials, can't remember of what, um, what happened before the pre-registration, 57% success rate after pre-registration, 8% 
when it really looks like it's just a null, null effect. So we have more and more of these findings that really suggest that uh, pre-registration and register reports help. So by now I have this, it does one, it does two, it does three, it does four, it does five. So lots of evidence accumulating to show that uh, it hinders publication bias and all sorts of us fooling, fooling ourselves. Now we come to the question of why you should do open science. Uh, how can this benefit you? And from that, we can learn about what perhaps uh, this would be helpful for you in your career and all sorts of worries that you might have about pursuing uh, open science. So now we have these kinds of studies that keep coming out that it's also, it's uh, good for you and your career. So for example, if you post something as a preprint, if you share something with data, then you're more likely to get cited. So the citation rates for people who do register reports, for people who do pre-registrations, for people who do data sharing, for people who do preprints is higher than other, others. Uh, it also leads to more collaborations because people approach you, people build on your work. So you know, there's some studies that show that the average uh, citations for a paper everywhere is uh, under five. Uh, so a not a lot of citations for the average study. So if you want your study to be known, for it to be useful, for it to be verifiable, for it to be trustworthy, just share stuff. And there will also be the benefit of you uh, getting cited more, uh, getting more invitations for collaborations, for more people taking interest in your, in your work. Um, in terms of openness, of course, it uh, benefits everybody. Uh, taxpayers get value for their money. Uh, they should have got this to begin with. I don't understand why they didn't insist on this before. It doesn't make any sense for us to claim that anything is ours when we're just servants of the public. Um, so public can get access to information as fast as possible. Can you imagine what would happen if we wouldn't share information about COVID? That doesn't make any sense. If the Americans would just keep themselves from America, if China would only keep things for China, we need to share this as an academic community as fast as possible. Talked about already the uh, citation uh, rates, uh, the influence uh, policy, and more exposure, and so forth. This is a really nice summary of all sorts of benefits uh, that open science can give you uh, just recently by University of Cape Town. And uh, I think it really helps to uh, for you to increase trust in your science, to get some really good constructive feedback, especially if you're doing a registered report increase the rate of discovery, and then just be inclusive, allow access to anybody uh, from around, around the world. In addition, things are changing. So for example, there are more and more job offers. So if you go on this uh, website over here, you'll see that there's actually quite a few job offers that insist on you saying how you address open science. I've been trying to do the same thing here at HKU. So one of the questions during your job talk, your job interview, your job application would be, how have you, what have you done in order to contribute to open science, to do open science? What are your experiences of doing open science in your own research? So if you're thinking, but I don't see these right now, first of all, there are quite a few. They're mostly in Germany and the Netherlands and the UK, but it's happening. Uh, it's also happening here in Hong Kong because last year there was the Hong Kong Open Access uh, Assessment Principles so Hong Kong and the Dora and all places around the world are shifting to evaluating rather than number of publications, rather than impact factor, rather than you know, prestige and reputation. It's more about visiting the actual research that you do. What have you done in order to show that this is rep replicable? Have you done register reports? Are you, your samples well powered? Um, you know, everything that has to do with rigor, um, have you done replication? So all these are very, very important in order for other people to know that your uh, research is trustworthy. So it's increasing. I feel like in five years, this is gonna be a real, a real thing. Um, and more and more will insist on you showing that you are doing open uh, research. Another thing, this is all these slides are from Dan Quintana who did a very good job talking about this. He has like a, a, a short talk. Uh, and I completely agree that it's not that if you do open research, um, that open science, that it creates more work, but rather than just the typical uncertainty that you have in a traditional model of research report, the only thing is, is that it shifts some of the um, 
some of the points into earlier in the life cycle. So um, you just do more of the analysis at the beginning, you do more of the peer review, but then later things go much, much smoother. So every time we do a register report, you know, most of the time is invested before the register report, but after you get the in principle acceptance, all you need to do is just proceed to the data collection and then just write up the results. There's no uncertainty because you know this is gonna get published. You just follow the procedure, you know exactly what needs to be done. So most of the time spent is actually just the peer reviewers making sure that you follow your pre-registration. The actual analysis is very, very short. There's not a lot to do over there. Um, like I said, you don't need to go all the way. You've seen my own journey as adopted step by step. Uh, you can pick and choose. You can start from something that seems easy, uh, then move on to something that seems like medium or hard. Um, as you gain some experience, uh, you, it will be easier for you to do to do things. And by now, I'm not even uh, thinking about all, you know, pre-registration is very, very trivial uh, to me. Registry reports seem like a big task, but now we try to do more of these. So a lot of things that seemed impossible to me in 2017, you know, only four years, which is the typical time for a PhD, uh, you can become an expert in this or even lead and inform others, including your PI or your lab mates or your classmates, whoever those, those are. Um, your future self. Another, another slide, a uh, series of slides. I really like this selfish reason. So why you want to do this. And I, I love these uh, categories, avoid the disaster, easier to write paper. So for example, how avoid disaster, some good slides over here. <laughs> I like this ad that somebody took a snapshot of. Uh, the external hard drive that was lost is very important to me as it contains five years of research data, which is crucial for my PhD thesis. Can you imagine a month before you submit your PhD thesis, uh, your laptop with all your data gets, gets stoning because you haven't been reproducible, you haven't shared this on the open science framework. How devastating is that? Um, so it turns out that these are real cases. Actually, you can see here a science paper that was uh, retracted, or I think expression of concern. The authors have notified science, theft of a computer on which the raw data for the paper was stored, just like one computer. It hasn't been shared with the open science framework or some uploaded publicly somewhere, at least in the university. It was this one computer and that one computer got stolen and now you can verify something that was published in science. In science, it's like the top journal. How can they not insist on this being uh, deposited somewhere publicly? So science is publishing editorial expression of concern. So why not learn from this? This was 2016, learn from this and then just make sure that this doesn't happen again by making everything reproducible. When people submit to science, just make them so, like I refuse to review any papers that don't have open data, open code that I can verify. Uh, and many times when I ask the editors, the editors contact the authors and the authors say, yeah, sure, I've uploaded this to the open science framework. So you just need to insist on this. You need to help them make the right decision, not just because I want to do a better review job, not just because I want this to be more trustworthy, but also for them so that they remember what it is that they've done. So very, very important. Uh, for me, also, catching errors early, uh, I really worry that in some years, you know, something that I've published would uh, have some errors, and I would really rather catch this now. Can you imagine, like, uh, wire and strule that I just said with a, with a priming, you know, 1979 had some statistical errors. Do you want to wait 40 years until somebody finds out that there was an error? And then it doesn't replicate after a hundred labs from around the world invested millions of dollars. Nobody wants this kind of feeling. You don't want to be this kind of person at the end of your career after you know a lot of things have happened. Suddenly you realize that you've done a mistake 40 years ago and that actually what you've published and has 2000 citations doesn't replicate. So think about your future self, not your present self, your future self. You know, do you want to be in this kind of, this kind of situation? Reproducibility also helps you to write papers um, in, in that the next paper is going to be much easier for you to do. 
Uh, it's also easier to communicate to reviewers so the reviewers can check your work and understand you better so they can go into your code and see how things are. And it enables con uh, continuity. Um, so for example, if the, uh, you, know, you take over somebody else's job, the previous postdoc, maybe they didn't do a very good job in uh, writing everything. So just writing everything in a reproducible way makes sure that whoever takes over is able to do this uh, well. Uh, just sharing everything because you don't know who is going to be the next person. You don't even know what's going to happen with you. Will you remember in two years what it is that you've done? So this is an unfortunate one. I'm sorry, I don't remember. I did this analysis six months ago. I forgot. Why did you forget? Why isn't everything documented? So it's also helping your future self address this sort of thing. You don't want to be in a position where somebody asks you about your research and then you say, honestly, I don't remember. What do you mean you don't remember? This is science. You need to be able to allow others to check your work, build on your work. So um, yeah, can't remember. And then there's also something about a reputation. So you want to build your reputation as somebody who uh, is, you know, has solid research. So I like this uh, tweet by Dorothy Bishop, applicants for a fellowship, please preprint your paper. So if you preprint, it allows, when you apply, it allows others to see your preprint. It's not only the published papers, but just the fact that you have a preprint, the uh, job committee, uh, the hiring committee, the PhD committee will go and look at your uh, your uh, preprint. If there's no preprint, they just need to take your word for it as a citation manuscript in preparation. That doesn't make a lot of sense. It's very difficult. It's impossible to check this. But if you have a preprint, people can see what you are about. Um, so more than just like under review, just say, here's a preprint, go and read my work. And then perhaps even these preprints are going to get some citations. So that's uh, valuable. Like I said before, there are more job offers that mention open science. So forth. Okay, so I've, I've talked a lot about all sorts of things about open science. The last section is really uh, about my own journey of what I decided to do. So after I finished with Maastricht University and I started my position as an assistant professor here in, in Hong Kong, what did I decide to do about uh, teaching? And how, how did I move from doing this with three master's students and three, four early career researchers uh, working on, on, on their uh, outputs. How, did, uh, how was I able to reach 100 of these uh, publications and, and extensions? So just as a recap, um, before we move on, uh, we've had, I've had with my students, this uh, Yajin Gao and Tijen, um, they did their thesis with me and then I invited Ignacio and John to take over and submit this to the journal. So we had a, a proof of concept that was very valuable. And then I had this dilemma, can I do this on a larger scale? Can I do this more than just three? And the second dilemma that I had is like, what should I do with my teaching? So I'm gonna be an assistant professor. They're asking me to teach advanced social psychology, fundamentals of social psychology, judgment decision-making. Some of these findings, I, I don't uh, know if they replicate. I don't know if they're good. Some of these findings I already know don't replicate and they're in the books. So what should I do? And then my decision was that we need to mass mobilize the students and the early career researchers uh, and change the way that we teach. I built my model around other things that are happening. Uh, you can join CREP or the Psychological Science Accelerator. And I also really believe in this heading over there, uh, headline, uh, why students are the answer to psychology replication crisis. So if it's just uh, assistant professors or scholars, postdocs, uh, it's gonna take a lot of time until we tackle this uh, so-called crisis, uh, but we need to do as many replications and extensions as possible so we can actually mass mobilize uh, even undergraduates, perhaps even high school kids in order to do uh, real science and also hear from perspectives about how we can teach uh, replications in open science. So traditionally, how we thought about teaching is that uh, the instructor, uh, in this case, I thought that it's gonna be me, is just standing in front of a classroom and then just like pointing to the PowerPoint and saying, you know, the truth is social priming or ego depletion or power pausing and all that. But I already know that this is not this is not sustainable. First of all, we don't know what the truth is. So how can we tell this to the students? We need to verify this. 
rather than them being very passive over here and just like assuming that I know uh, everything, we need to change the model. This is a book that was published not too long ago, two months ago, I think, three months ago by Adam Grant about the need to adopt a scientist mindset. Uh, so we need to rewrite the textbook. We need to teach students, early career researchers to question knowledge. So we need humility. We need to learn by doing. Uh, we need to embrace confusion and uncertainty. We need to understand that science is messy. Not everything is positive. Some days we have hypotheses that are supported. Some days they're not supported. No findings are part of the process. Not everything is this dichotomy of p-value lower or higher than 0.05. There's a, a continuum of, of all sorts of effects that are just by the randomness of the universe. You know, we expect some kind of distribution over there. And we can't be uh, the ones to inform uh, students about science. We need a journey where students join us in order to, for us to inform one another, for us to learn together, uh, for us to question knowledge, build on knowledge, accommodate knowledge in order to help science uh, do better and address all the problems that are, are currently happening. In Maastricht University, I learned a different method of teaching. It's called the problem-based learning. And it's really about collaboration. So there's no more of this uh, me standing in front of the, of the classroom, but rather in Maastricht University, the tutors stand uh, or sit in the back and the students are the ones that do everything. So they have this round table and they facilitate each other. They, um, we give them a problem. They think what's interesting about this problem. What can we learn from this problem? They set their own learning goals. Then they go out, they seek the information, then they come back to the meeting, they in integrate the knowledge, and then they come up with some kind of a solution. Or at least what needs to be done is the next step. So we were not really allowed to interfere. It's not like we had a lot to interfere for. It's we just needed to make sure that the process works well, that uh, you know everybody is included, that nobody is overlooked, and that everybody is involved. And I can say with confidence that the problem-based learning students of Maastricht were far more engaged and far more motivated to uh, pursue uh, science and knowledge than any other students that I've ever uh, seen. So I really wanted to do this when I came to uh, HKU. So I decided when I became a, an assistant professor that I'm going to do my courses in a different way. I want my courses to be student-led. I want the students to do actual science with real impact that they would do the entire scientific process. So things like peer review, very, very valuable. I want students to experience peer review. So now if you join our, our project, you will see the kind of situation and I'll show you what the process uh, looks like. But everything that we do is open. Everything is shared. Everything is Google Docs. Every time the students do something, not only are they reviewing each other, but I also go on Twitter and I invite others to join us. So by now we have about 50, uh, five zero of uh, these early career researchers from around the world that are helping us peer review the students' work. Sometimes original authors come in and comment on the students' uh, Google Docs. So can you imagine the excitement of a student that writes a replication, uh, you know, designs an extension, and then suddenly the person from the 1970s and the 80s comes in and, and comments on their Google Doc. It's very, very exciting. And then the students, uh, and we guide them, we try to work together with them about using the latest tools and trends in psychological science. So there's no more of these books with problematic findings. There's no more of this truth that I have and they don't. Uh, I learn together with them. They inform me, they invite me to uh, go with them on their journey into open science and their applications and extensions. So I embrace everything about this uh, uh, open science uh, umbrella and I try to pass this along to the students. If you want to see what the syllabus uh, looks like, uh, that's also open. It's a Google Doc. It's about 25 to 30 pages long. So uh, students need to read this in detail. They actually have uh, an exam a quiz on the syllabus that they need to complete by the second week uh, because this is a contract. They need to understand that there's uncertainty. They need to understand the, the structure. They need to not worry too much because the son is, how can I do? I'm a second year, fourth year undergraduate. I've never done any science in my life. I can barely do a t-test. How can I do a replication and extension of this famous study, you know, Nobel Prize winning uh, thousands of citations? Who am I? So um, 
we we try to ensure that uh, they understand the process, that they understand understand the complexity, but also that we'll support them. So if you want to see what this looks like, uh, you're very welcome to have a look at our syllabus and learn from that. The most important thing that I think to take away from everything is that you can do this as well. If our undergraduates can do this, you can also do this. And I think the secret to success, uh, I know other places in the world who have you know, that tried to, to run these kind of mass replications in their own departments, but uh, were not successful. I think the secret to success here at University of Hong Kong has to do with uh, these following components. So first, first of all, examples. I provide them with a lot of examples, good examples. So by now we've been running this for three years. The last two semesters were exceptional good. So a lot of examples that you, that you can come in and, and uh, learn from. By now we've developed a lot of templates. I've shown you uh, some of these uh, templates, not only for how to write these replications and extensions, but also how to do peer review. And then we have a lot of guides how to write a pre-registration, how to design an extension, and then um, how to analyze, how to plan a data analysis uh, in Jamovi, Jasmine, or how to calculate effect size and confidence intervals, how to do a power analysis. So all these, you can click on these uh, links over here and see the kind of work. All these are collaborative. The collaborative means that if you've contributed something, just add your name at the top, say what it is that you contributed, and if it's a meaningful contribution and we submit this to the journal, you become a co-author. So this is really the power of community. So if you want your uh, project to succeed, this is, this is what you need in order to make it, make it successful. Um, so these are my tips. I also strongly suggest to really be very open about everything. So if the students know that everything is Google Docs, if they know that everything is shared on the open science framework, if they know that everything is collaborative, they take it seriously. They also know that this is gonna be submitted to a journal. They take it very, very seriously. We also have uh, support in terms of Slack. So uh, strong communication. Uh, I don't answer emails. So if somebody has a question, they ask me on Slack, I, ask, I answer this publicly so everybody else can learn uh, from that. Everything is documented. Uh, I try to answer mostly in our guides and then refer the students over there. So I send them a link, go and have a look at the guide. And then it's very important that we have a lot of checks and balances for catching errors because these are students, because there's so many ways to make a mistake. Because I'm just one person, it's impossible for me to catch everything. So we have a lot of these checks and balances and I'll give you an example how to do this. So uh, first of all, students review one another, then we have teaching assistants, with research background, and then we recruit early career researchers. It could be you if you're interested to come over, verify everything, take the lead. We have two models. One is the pre-registration and the other is register reports. Um, we've seen this already. So these are our two tracks. Previously, when I had some money, we just did the whole thing. We did even the data collection. In one semester, they did completed pre-registered replications and extensions. Uh, last semester, I did not have money, uh, but it's okay because we moved into the more uh, solid way of doing science, of doing register reports, stage one. So this is before data collection, and we actually submit to the journal this pre-registration uh, pre plan, uh, register report stage one, in order to get some feedback. So if you're an early career researcher and you want to come in and join us, you can take lead on one of these two. Uh, these, we have 72 of these. These, we have about uh, 13. It's about 20 that are pending. This is an example from autumn 2019. Uh, we had 11 replications, but replications is just, it's not just like one sample. There's two groups of two students working independently. We do two large data collection. Uh, one, we do this with Americans on Amazon Mechanical Turk. The second is a British participants on Prolific Academic. And then we have very high power uh, from 600 participants to 2,200 participants of so very large samples. Each one of these teams has uh, designs an extension. Um, so that was a very successful, successful one. You can see our, uh, the way that we uh, do this uh, process. So we start from an analysis of the original article. Uh, we have uh, this in the guide if you want to follow how we do this step by step. And then they uh, use Qualtrics, which is a survey platform, in order to reproduce, uh, reconstruct what the original was. 
Then they generate random data sets, they create a simulated data set, and then they run data analysis code on that. It's a little bit like how I prepared the demonstration that we had earlier on. Uh, and then they need to write up this pre-registration report. So we have these two teams working independently. Then at this stage, when they have a pre-registration report, they peer review one another. Then I go on Twitter and I say, who wants to help us review this? And then other people come in. Then they have a week to revise this. Then there's like about two weeks uh, with very little sleep where I verify all the pre-registrations. I make sure everything is solid. I go and get a data collection. I have two data sets. I give this to the uh, two different teams. They analyze this, then they peer review each other. They write up the final report. They get them external feedback. And finally, there's a revised final report. So here at the end, this is an APA style submission ready manuscript. Uh, ideally, uh, especially in the last semester, that semester very, very close to submission ready. However, we then invite early career researchers to come in, have a look and lead this by verifying, make sure, making sure that it's solid and so forth. If you want to see what that looks like, uh, the link is over here. These are very, very impressive uh, projects. And you can see just how, uh, how impressive this is uh, because of the rigor, the pre-registrations are typically, I don't know, 50 pages, 60 pages of a pre-registration. If you really want to see a high quality pre-registration, a high quality write-up, uh, well-powered samples, have a look at these two uh, groups working independently, two different extensions, terrific stuff by the students here at University of Hong Kong. The last semester, we ran register reports. So no data collection, they just did simulation, very simple design, only uh, I did not collect any data. And this here, after they wrote the pre-registration, this is what we invite early career researchers to come in, integrate this, verify things, and then submit this to the journal. We now have so five different teams that are working on this and hopefully we'll be able to submit the, the first register report fast. Um, what else do we have? Um, yeah, so the Hong Kong principles I told you about that happened uh, last year um, in the sixth World Conference of Research Integrity. So Hong Kong principles are talking about assessing responsible research practices uh, they value complete reporting, so no more of these impact factors and you know all these uh, measurements that don't mean much, but really focusing on you know credibility, reward the practice of open science, uh, all kinds of research activities. So if you rather uh, write packages, if you're more of a replicator than somebody who does novel novel research, if you're more of a data collector rather than uh, hypothesizing, whatever it is that your role is. And acknowledging really a broad range of research uh, research activities, um, and then recognize things like peer reviewing and mentoring. That's also really important. You're contributing to the community. It's just not doesn't necessarily come in in the form of leading a science uh, nature PNAS paper. So if you have some time, you can have a look at this and learn a bit more about that. There's also all sorts of other slides. I'm not going to go uh, over this. I think I'm gonna uh, stop here at this point. Um, yeah, I'm not gonna go into this in more detail. I'm gonna leave this for now. And we don't have a lot of time, but uh, I'm gonna stop here and just uh, see if you have any questions, if there's something that you wanna talk about. I'm gonna stay here for as long as you want. So if there's something that you want to raise, if there's something that you want to chat to me about, then please ask whatever it is that's on your mind. And I'll try to tell you from my experience what is the best way to address this. So thank you so much for attending this workshop. I hope you found this uh, useful. If at any point you feel like uh, there's something here that you want to talk to me about, these are my details. This is my email. This is my website. I'm very active on Twitter. If you want to know more, about uh, future workshops, about our activities, about our publications, our preprints, uh, then please go on this mailing list and subscribe and we'll inform you about what's to come. Thank you very much. Hope to see you in the next workshops.